Hey oh, two wheel friends, Zach Quartz here with Spurgeon Dunbar. This is season seven, episode 11 of High Side, Low Side. Coming at you in this episode, we are answering your viewer and listener comments. It should be a good time. There is no guest. The inmates are in charge of the asylum this time around. Also on the show, do big bikes belong off road? And what do you do when your tire is out of air on the side of the road? How the heck do you fill it up? Before we get to all that, a quick word from our sponsor, Motul. I recently returned from Sturgis, South Dakota, where I was visiting our colleague Patrick Garvin over at J&P Cycles, and he had just returned from the inaugural trip of his Gold Digger Custom Harley-Davidson build, and during that off-road trek, he blew a seal. So when I showed up, there was Motul engine oil all over the floor of his garage. And after he finished repairing his uh, little faux pas, he shoved a whole bunch of Motul back into the engine case because Motul makes it easy for all you American V-Twin aficionados out there. Whether you're just, you know, building a project in your garage or you're just buying one off the showroom floor, Motul has you covered with gear oil, engine oil, and transmission oil, making it very simple to keep your favorite Harley Davidson lubricated. So to check out all the Motul products, you can go to revzilla.com slash Motul. That's M-O-T-U-L. And while you're over there, make sure you check out Revzilla's RPM program. That stands for Riders Plus membership with all kinds of crazy additional benefits for people like you, people that love motorcycling that are constantly buying gear, parts, and apparel. So to learn more about that, you can check it out at revzilla.com slash RPM. Now, on with the show. All righty, everybody. We are jumping in to high side, low side. This is the penultimate episode of the season. Spurgeon, a couple seasons ago, learned what that word means. What does it mean, Spurge? Second to last, Zach. Nice. Everybody right. learns something on the high side, <laughs> low side podcast, including the hosts. <laughs> Especially the host. Okay, <laughs> so first up, uh, as usual, would be not the news. And um, our uh, our colleague, our lovely colleague, Dustin Whelan here in Revzilla West team, wrote an article titled, and I quote, the new ADV marketing sending big bikes into treacherous, hard enduro terrain. Basically covering, um, you know, lots of brands sending expert riders on these big bikes into historically dirt bike events. Um, for the sake of, uh, well, for the sake of what, Spurge? Pure entertainment. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, honestly, it's it's super entertaining. It's also a marketing exercise to show that sure. these bikes are capable of, of competing at this level. Uh, yep. But it's also gotten some critique. And you really, I think, from a not the news standpoint, the question becomes: Is this a good thing or is this a bad thing for the adventure bike segment? And you know, what are our what are our personal thoughts? So I, I think if there's no other setup necessary here, no, I'm gonna have. Our uh, our new helper, uh, Michael Messina, Eminem, as we like to call him around the <laughs> studio. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chase, producer Chase, is still out with the uh, the sickness. Um, so we're going to have uh, Michael step in and run the timer for us today. So we are going now. So, Zach, <laughs> big bikes in crazy, treacherous, you know, uh, Red Bull, Romaniacs type hard Enduros, are you enjoying them? Do you think it's the right thing, the wrong thing to do? Where's your Where's your head at? I think it's a very obvious um, step to take from a marketing standpoint, as you said, right? Because you're like, can this? Can you even ride this bike off road? Well, this you know godlike rider can, so why can't you? Is <laughs> a sort of form of inspiration. But the thing that I like about it is that I I. I don't, I, I don't have any data to back this up, but I feel like brands probably end up learning a thing or two about the machine when they do stuff like this, right? You have um, uh, Paul Tares or you have Ivan Cervantes or you have uh, whoever, whoever, some some gnarly off-road rider take your adventure bike and slam it through a hard enduro course and stuff's probably break, going to break. And I feel like that's something that uh, ultimately benefits the consumer, hopefully, because because KTM, Triumph, Yamaha, Honda, Ducati. whoever it is, yeah, Ducati, yeah giving giving a bike um, to a you know a professional off road rider and having them ride it in a in a manner that is not probably what a lot of the engineers had in mind. I think um, I think it only leads to stronger bikes down the road. That's 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 my glass half full 
uh, attitude. What about you? So I like it because it's opening up um, some competition to uh, a different segment of motorcycling. So for all of these people uh -huh. that do have adventure bikes, you know, I started uh, doing an event up in Canada a couple years ago where you go up and it's like a 24 hour kind of endurance challenge. And it's just, it's fun. It's fun to go up with some friends and see if you can get your bikes through it. The, the downside to this is that I do think it's inviting criticism, right? A adventure bikes have always gotten critique from people, especially on the internet, saying, oh, those bikes are too big and heavy to do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. So yeah. now, all of a sudden, the manufacturers are trying to show all this crazy stuff you can do, and now the critique has turned, well, you can only do that if you're a professional rider. And <laughs> I, I think where it, it, it fails to, to kind of translate for some of these people is that these bikes have gotten really good. You know, they're not the same bikes they were 10 or 15 years ago, especially as we're looking at this middleweight class of bikes. Yep, and yep. They, they are bikes that the average person can go out and buy and maybe not go to hard, hard enduro on, but have a much easier time riding off-road. And, and I sure. think and, that's and, what, I, what I take out of it. Yeah, I think the that, yeah, it's that's sort of a that's I think that's adjacent to the point that I was making, right? Is that the the capability of the machine um, is what's on display? Because frankly, when I see a Red Bull Romaniacs or Herzberg Rodeo or whatever hard enduro thing, I'm I'm watching. It's not like if I see someone doing it on a Tenere 700 or Ducati Desert X or um, something like that, an adventure bike. It's not like I'm looking at that terrain and thinking, oh, oh well, if I was just on a KTM 350 EXC, then I would be fine because right. I'm a regular rider. It's hard. It's, it's hard anyway. So I think it only stands to benefit the bike. Well, we are officially out of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know. I ran over. I ran over. No, no, no. It's not you because I, I still want to keep <laughs> – like, I think it's a very interesting topic. And again, the the, the timer uh, is are the rules that we play by. But considering we're making the rules, then you know what? I'm going <laughs> to just raise my finger here. Um, Zach and I, you know, we were talking a little bit offline here. When I brought my 890 – back from uh, South Dakota where we were riding for like 10 days in like, you know, kind of more gnarly, rocky, aggressive conditions, it does take a bigger toll on the bike. So I do think, you know, Zach mentioned earlier about manufacturers using these situations to test the durability. Um, if you are planning on using your adventure bike to this to this extent, you do have to plan on doing more maintenance. You have to do more regular oil changes. The suspension is going to have to be serviced, you know, probably more frequently as I'm currently finding out uh, with Sally the Rally. So, like, it is one of those things, too, where just being understanding that if you're not using the adventure bike as a street touring road bike and you're using it as a hardcore off-road dirt bike, you're probably going to have to maintain it a little bit differently too. And I think setting some of those expectations up front, the manufacturers would do themselves justice to say, like, if you're going to, there's, there's two different service intervals here. There's a service interval for those of you riding it like a street bike and a service interval for those of you riding it like a, you know, Erzberg Enduro bike. Um, that's the only right. thing I wanted to throw in there as a, a point of understanding uh, as, as people out there in the audience, you know, might be, thinking or trying to do even just a, a regular week-long, you know, dual sport trip with their bike. True enough. I think we got to move on. Otherwise, Spurgeon will just talk about adventure bikes the yeah. whole time. Everyone, and nobody which is, wants um, that. Nobody. That's, that's <laughs> arguably an entire other podcast. Indeed. Um, so, uh, with the listener... Uh, viewer comment question episode. Um, some of you may remember that um, rather than giving away a t-shirt at the end, as we often do, we give away the t-shirt right up front here um, so that we can just go into all of the, um, all the, the, the comments and questions and keep that flow a rolling. So this time around, uh, the t-shirt winner is a, is a comment and a question of sorts. Spurge, why don't you take it away? Yep. And uh, this comment, as always, came in uh, from Apple Podcasts. We mm. uh, asked that everybody leave us an Apple Podcast review. Helps with distribution of the podcast. And as a reward for you taking the time to review this podcast and say nice things about Zach and myself, we like to reward every now and then, every episode, <laughs> uh, one person with a t-shirt. Uh, this podcast uh, review winner is Awesome Saudi. Grew up with bikes in my life from as far back as I can remember. I've started your podcast from the beginning, and so far, I've liked it. Well, we don't know how far they've gotten uh, until we get <laughs> on to the next part two. of this comment. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Something driving me nuts. So currently, it sounds like this person is uh, making their way through season six, and they say on season gotcha. six, episode yeah. seven, 
in the biggest motorcycle controversies episode, you folks keep talking about repairing tires alongside the road, and I'm curious as to how you plan on getting air back in the tire once you're done patching or plugging it. Well, fair question. I think this is an easy thing to to um, to to stumble across when you're thinking about that happening, right? Your tire goes flat, you put a patch on it. That's all well and good, but um, but you're not near a gas station. Maybe you don't want to carry a big bicycle pump. What do you do, Spurgeon? So a couple different options, um, <laughs> and and I think it's it it kind of depends on what you want to carry with you. So you can do an electric pump. Um, I've used an electric pump in the past. You can usually get them small and compact enough that they mm-hmm. fit underneath the seat of your motorcycle. You then plug them into your cigarette lighter uh, or the little charging port on your bike, uh, or yep, you can get them with port. a or you can get them with a jumper cable that actually jumps off to your battery, and you plug them in and it pumps up your tire for you. The second option is compressed air, little CO2 cartridges like some of us when we were kids used in BB guns to power up a little BB gun, uh, but a little CO2 cartridge, and you probably need about two or three of those to get you enough air to get down the road, and that just screws into a little nozzle, screws onto the the, the thread for your inflator for the tire, and your valve stem is the official word, and <laughs> you can put air into your tire that way. The mm-hmm. final uh, third option that's, that's uh, uh, also positive here, or something that you could consider, is a small bicycle pump. So uh, much like road bicyclists use or mountain bike bicyclists use, you can get a small little compact pump that actually fits very simply onto your motorcycle. That, I've used those in the past. That is probably my least favorite option. There is a lot of hand pumping that's required to get that to work. And it, it really, it's, it really it's, does take a lot of effort. It's a, it's a better option when you're on a very cold ride because yes. you'll end up, you'll end up putting a lot of effort into, into that. Yeah. Um, but it, it, uh, does the trick and it is, um, yeah, it's a, you know, Tried and true, you might it, say. <laughs> it, it reminds me of the episode of uh, Family Guy when uh, Quagmire discovers internet porn and he comes out and he reaches for the mailbox and his forearm on the right hand is just bulging. Uh, so it's it's very much not the right. preferred method of, of pumping up your you know and, giant motorcycle tire. I, I and personally- if you're, if you're listening with your children, we'll let you explain <laughs> that joke to them. I, uh, I, um, I have switched over. I prefer the CO2 cartridges. I used to carry the um, the inflator pump, and I found that it just it took a long time to yeah. to get the tire filled up. And if you are using tubes, uh, oftentimes you'll need to reseat the bead if you're trying to put air into a tire that um, that has you know tubes in it. You have to reseat the bead of the tire if you're actually fixing a a, a flat that way. So right. the CO2 shoots all the air in at once and i have found that it's typically a little bit easier if you do have to reset the bead yeah it's pretty uh it's pretty slick system there anywho hope that helps you out awesome saudi and um please do remember to send your preferred uh t-shirt size and your preferred mailing address to high side low side at revzilla.com so that we can reward you with a t-shirt um normally we don't answer questions um in the podcast review free t-shirt section of the uh, episode. But being that it's the viewer listener comment episode, we felt like it was appropriate. Ace Burge. Um, Can I, and, are you uh, okay if I give one more little tip there? Oh, sure. By all means. Uh, so I've, I started carrying a little uh, tube, a little like plastic tube of Dawn dish detergent with me in my tank bag, because mm. if you are repairing a flat and you do need to reset the bead, it just acts as a little bit of a lubricant that you can put around the edge of the bead and it helps to, to pop the bead back onto the tire as well. Yeah. 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 Having, having a little bit of uh, soap or something like that's always good for a tire change, whether you're doing it at home or on the side of the trail. And obviously Spurge has tubes in his tires because there's no way that Spurgeon Dunbar would be caught out on a trail with tubeless tires are you kidding me yeah and that's entirely another podcast because we're not going to get into that right now but yes i am a tube that man is, is. for life <clears throat> speaking of which let's jump into this podcast let's get to the meat and potatoes with comment number one this comes in from beckett who wrote us an email and says i'm on summer break from college now and i enjoy listening to high side low side it recently encouraged me to get into motorcycling, especially after my mid midlife crisis of my girlfriend of four years breaking up with me. Ah, heartache. It is, it is no stranger to us here on High Side, Low Side. 
Uh, in a semi-impulse and totally unregretted decision, I finally pulled the trigger on a brand new Ninja 400 to start my legal motorcycling journey, and I've absolutely loved every second of it so far. Well, I'm devastated with the breakup. Yeah, it sounds like you're going in the right direction, Beckett, so you, you, you push through. Uh, <laughs> motorcycling has been a great emotional and mental escape to which I'm sure many can relate in one way or another. Instantly Indeed. winning back the heart of my high school sweetheart by sheer coolness on the sport bike, however, did not work as well as I had hoped. However, <laughs> as Zach promised in Daily Rider uh, on the episode of the Ninja 400, it's guaranteed to attract plenty of potential lovers. Mm, mm, mm. While I'm waiting for that to happen, however, I'd appreciate it if the uh, the more handsome host, I'll let you two figure out which one that is, uh, of High Side Low Side share his secrets in using a motorcycle as a way of attracting a lover or perhaps uh, to break my heart again. So Zach, as the more handsome of the two of us, why don't you <laughs> kick off uh, explaining to Beckett uh, your secrets in using a motorcycle to attract the love of your life? <laughs> Uh, I think, um, yeah, that's what I was going to tell you, uh, that since you're the pretty boy, uh, you should answer this question, but I was the one on, I uh, was the one that recorded the daily rider, uh, saying that, uh, the Ninja 400 is quote unquote guaranteed to attract plenty of lovers as, as Beckett said, uh, <clears throat> so first of all, I need to cover that. I was being somewhat sarcastic when I said that Beckett, um, I, I think that, um, the, the the idea that a, a a motorcycle a sport bike in general is is attractive to the person that you are um, interested in is I think um, I don't want to say like a myth or completely false or anything I think it's a it's a it's a bit of self narrative right it's something that like we tell ourselves we would be like I'm doing this thing and it's very cool. Therefore other people will probably think that I'm cool. Or perhaps in your head, you're thinking if someone were attracted to me on this Kawasaki Ninja, well then I would probably like them right back because we would have lots to talk about. So I think it's a, it's a, it's really more of a theoretical attraction. I'm afraid than, um, than, than, than there being actual, you know, throngs of, of, uh, people, you know, coming at you trying to give him your phone number now ha phone now number. hang on a second zachary because okay did you not meet your now wife via motorcycling in some way or another i did meet via motorcycling that's a that's a that's a fair point here's um i'm gonna i'm gonna take a step back beckett and i don't i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to i don't want this to turn into too much of a therapy session here I don't think you need therapy, if I'm being perfectly honest. Sounds like things are going great. Sure, you had some heartbreak. You had a, you had a breakup. Uh, who among us hasn't had that? That's part of life. Um, you, you went after motorcycling. You're really enjoying it. That's great. Um, in so much as your motorcycling career overlaps with your love life, sure, there are um, people who... Uh, you know, bond over motorcycling and that becomes a big part of their relationship. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, my advice to you would be don't have motorcycling be the piece of your identity that you hang your, um, romantic self on, if that makes sense. Um, motorcycling should be a part of your life that you enjoy and it's something that you do and you like. Um, but if the person is only attracted to you because of your Kawasaki Ninja, what might happen if your Kawasaki Ninja is no more? Or mm. if motorcycling in your life uh, becomes a, a, a lesser thing? You don't want that. You want them to be attracted to the you, Beckett, not to the Ninja. So, so don't, don't, don't put too much emphasis on that. If you wanna you know, drop into a conversation that you ride a motorcycle here and there, hey, I can't blame you for that. But, um, but I don't think that that should be the, the foundation on which you build the relationship with your next uh, um, lover, so to I, speak. <laughs> I, I think what I'm learning is that uh, we're going to launch another podcast, um, <laughs> and it's going to be a, a love relationship podcast uh, for the lonely right. motorcycling men. Uh, and every out there. episode, every episode will be just by a ninja. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time. Um, so Beckett, I'll just throw in that I do think, uh, as somebody, you know, Zach and I both in a way met our significant others because of motorcycling, or at least there was a, an understanding 
by our significant others uh, of how much motorcycling meant in our lives. And mm, yep. I often, I oftentimes hear from people about, oh, well, you know, my significant other won't let me do this and they don't want me to, to continue down this path and I'm going to have to go in a different direction. So I, I do think it is important that as you are courting your next, uh, sweetheart, that <laughs> you are, you are clear with this person about your hobbies and your interests and motorcycling is something that usually comes as a shock uh, or can sometimes come as a shock to, to people because it's not as as you know prevalent as you might expect. So I do think that I consider myself very fortunate that my wife never questions if I say I'm going to go out for a dirt bike ride or I'm going to go r race a motorcycle or spend a week you know riding adventure bikes. I, th I think that I have to make sure that I'm balanced in my time. I can't just spend all of my time riding anymore because I have to you know balance that attention. But she understands that motorcycling is something that I will do until the end of time or until I can no longer you know perform that that action. And I, I think Zach's probably in a similar situation. So. I do think that it is important for anyone listening to have those those conversations. I would agree. Yeah. Um, I hope that uh, I hope that helps, Beckett. <laughs> uh, but you are obviously pretty desperate if you're asking us for um, for advice in your love life. So we will leave it at that, and we will change gears, so to speak, Spurgeon, and move on to comment number two, which comes from Dallin. And um, yeah, Dallin says. And I quote, I've heard the stock gearing on my CBR 650R is quite tall, and I just don't need to go 150 miles an hour. So should I get a sprocket change? I've heard that it has some effect on uh, wear on the chain, but we give you more get up and go. Is a sprocket change something Zach and Spurgey would do? Um, what do you think, Spurge? So you, would you, how, 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 um, how important or, um, or, or easy would you say a sprocket change is? So this is going to tie into our, our third comment as well. Uh, we had an email in from Wyatt that asked a very similar question. Mm -hmm. um, and I think these, we wanted to pair these two together because they were they were both comments about gearing changes. So uh, is a sprocket change something Zach and Spurgey would do? Absolutely. Uh, Zach and I have both changed sprockets on, on depending on the bike that we're on. Uh, I think what a sprocket change will do for you is you can either get more acceleration quicker in the rev range and you know you can turn a lethargic motorcycle into something a bit more peppy or if you have a motorcycle that is uh, uh a bit buzzy at higher speeds you can use final gearing to change out a sprocket and give yourself a little bit more of a relaxed ride on on long highway speeds i've done i've done it in both directions so like for the triumph bonneville uh that i own for long highway treks i've reduce the gearing a little bit to allow myself a calmer ride on on higher speeds for my 350 i have that geared in a way that i get more acceleration actually first gear is pretty unusable um unless you just want to bring the front end up right away uh it's <laughs> it's a it allows me to start the bike in second gear and get a little bit more low speed maneuverability out of it um but yes you can fine tune gearing relatively easy uh, with just sprocket changes, and it does really affect wh which gear you want to be in for what mile per hour you are you are going. Mm -hmm. Just in case it's not clear what a sprocket is, what a gearing change is, um, for those of you that don't understand final drive gearing on motorcycles, what we're talking about is the uh, the 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 two sprockets that the chain rides around. If you can imagine a mountain bike. Um, there's a there's a chain wheel at the front where you pedal and there's a chain wheel at the back at the, at the and with a mountain bike you can change those gears right you can like go to a larger sprocket on the rear wheel of the bicycle and it will be easier for you to pedal and if you go to a smaller sprocket on the or a smaller chain wheel on the on the rear wheel of the bicycle it'll be harder for you to pedal but you can go faster same concept with a motorcycle sprocket changes are easy they're pretty cheap um, especially if you do the counter shaft sprocket, the small one at the front that's uh, that's attached to the engine, um, and uh, yeah, I I, th I think it's it's not difficult to do, and it's not expensive, and it's easy to reverse if you don't like it. So that's what I would tell. Um, that's what I would tell Dolan. Now for Dolan, the one question he did have, uh, he or she had was around the effect on the chain. Um, will it mm. will it have a, a effect on the wear? So what I have found, especially with uh, my dirt bike because I'm using a, 
I dropped to a 13 tooth sprocket in the front and that's a very small sprocket uh, for, for dirt. It's actually the smallest one you can get. Uh, I believe for that motorcycle and because it's because of the angle that it puts the chain at it does increase I, I wear out sprockets a little bit quicker um, on that. So to the point for your CBR uh, 650, I don't think it's gonna be an issue. I, I think if you want to you can uh, go up a couple teeth in the back or you can go down one tooth in the front Usually the difference is one tooth in the front is roughly like two and a half to three teeth in the back If you want more acceleration, you want to go up teeth in the back or down teeth in the front. And if you wanna go uh, slower acceleration, but more calm speeds in the highway, you wanna either reduce the amount of teeth you have on your rear sprocket or increase the amount of teeth you have on your front sprocket. So uh, that's those are the kind of ratios you can play around with. For somebody like yourself, Dallin, I would probably say going up two or three teeth on your rear sprocket will give you the acceleration you're looking for and will minimize any effect it has on chain on the on the chain wearing prematurely. Yeah, well said. So with regard to Wyatt's email, um, who uh, wrote in also talking about gearing, um, Wyatt says, uh, coming from a background of off-road RC racing, it is crazy to me that there isn't more of a focus within the motorcycle community on gearing tweaks. Um, Wyatt picked up a WR250R, that's a Yamaha dual sport motorcycle, um, uh, which is commonly criticized for a lack of low end grunt. Um, and, uh, Wyatt says geared it down a little bit. Now it's awesome. Accelerates really well. Um, uh, yeah. And, and Wyatt points out that coming to the motorcycling community, um, uh, they have noticed that it seems like people are okay accepting the fact that they need to change relatively expensive things like tires and suspension components and stuff like that. Um, but an inexpensive change in gearing is often over overlooked. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's a I think that's a very good point. Wyatt also did point out that when you change gearing, depending on how your motorcycle reads uh, speed for the speedometer, um, sometimes a um, a speedo healer is something that you could look to install, um, which is essentially a, a device that'll help your motorcycle compensate for the gearing change and keep the speedometer accurate. Yeah, but I think um, I, for for those of you listening, I think the the point of throwing in Wyatt's comment here is it, it kind of it justifies you know what what Dallin was asking. You know, there yes. are, there's a lot of people out there that might just not be aware of this, um, especially we need to get, new we need riders. To get Dallin's Dallin and and uh, and Wyatt hooked up on the same email so that there Wyatt can can talk Dallin through this gearing change thing. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think it made a, it, it was something that when Zach and I were going through the comments for this episode. Just throwing it out there for an awareness to everyone that you're not, unless you are, you know, uh, a BMW GS rider that has a shaft drive, or you're a belt rider that on like an HD, which kind of complicates things a little bit. You can kind of do the same thing with a with a belt drive, if I understand correctly, but it's not quite as easy as as just doing it with um, with a, a, a chain and sprockets. But right. the majority of bikes that are out there um, are are chain and sprockets, and this is something you can do. You know, relatively, relatively easily with some hand tools in your garage. Good point. Not every motorcycle; it's cheap and easy uh, to do. I, that, I, that's something I said, and then Spurge I made a good point there. Anyway, that's enough gearing talk for now. Um, let's talk about stopping. I Shall love it. Yes, this is Alex, who wrote in and said, "I bought a 1978 BMW R100/7 slash recently." Um, and it's my first older bike. I got it at a great price. It was well maintained by the original owner and I have some leftover funds for modifications. Now I'm not trying to start a debate about modding old bikes versus keeping them <laughs> original, uh, but the brakes feel like wooden blocks so far for us. And, and so far practicing emergency stops isn't leaving me with much confidence. Have mm. any of you ridden older bikes with modern brakes, do you think it would be worth the money and effort to retrofit, retrofit a new brake system? Now, Zach and I probably have some opinions on this, which we'll share in, in, a, in a minute here, but we <laughs> went to the authority. Zach <laughs> called his father, uh, Tim, and he is pretty much, I mean, do you know of anyone that knows more about old slash seven slash whatever <laughs> number BMWs than your father? Slash twos, fives, sixes, and sevens. Um, I don't know. I, I, he, he is. Uh, he would never claim to be an expert, but he has been um, 
tinkering and toying with um, airhead BMWs, you know, from the 50s, 60s, and 70s for decades now. Um, and uh, he is he's pretty familiar. So I, I called him and I asked, I had I mentioned that we had this question and he called me back and left me a voicemail. And uh, and producer Chase um, was enthusiastic to to play the voicemail for you specifically, Alex, but for anyone else who's wondering about um, BMW airhead brakes. So just before we dive into to, to our opinions on this, I'll let my dad explain to you what uh, what he thought about this. Sure enough, I do have opinions about airhead brakes. I think there are three different kinds of brakes. Later on in the 90s, they might have had some different ones. But basically, you have the drum brakes that I think work pretty well in Vermont, but maybe not in L.A. traffic. And also, you have to really stay on them and make sure that they're adjusted correctly. That's kind of something we're not used to anymore. And then they have the ATE brakes. ATE is the company that made the brakes, and those are early discs. They're um, single piston, which means that you have to adjust them from time to time, too. And, you know, brakes nowadays, you shouldn't have to do it. And so then you have the Brembo brakes, which was the standard of the world back then, and uh, they work pretty well. So a lot of people like to convert to them, and it's not that hard to convert. So you're able to just buy the parts that'll get you that or go up into my attic and find the parts. Uh, and you can also convert from a single ATE disc to a dual disc, which I recently did this summer on my uh, Flash 6, which worked out very well, I believe. It's uh, an okay break now instead of being a crappy break. Anyways, meantime, I'm hoping you're well. My love to everybody. Okay. Look at that. There you have it. Tim Coe's advice on, uh, on airhead brakes. Now, um, one thing I like about this is that... Um, He's inviting Alex up into his attic to just uh, rummage <laughs> yeah, around for brakes. There's a, there's a couple of good nuggets in there. One of them being um, that, he, that he said, like, I got brakes. If you need brakes, you just let me know. Um, but also... That uh, that he called out the drum brakes. You know, he was like, "Well, if you want to really, you know, if you want to have an old bike, so so my dad's basically calling you out, Alex, saying like, yeah, you can upgrade your brakes if you want to, but if you really want the good brakes, you get the drums, you know, from way back when." Um, so uh, that's obviously a breakdown of of the sort of within the the sphere of BMW airheads and sort of like what you can <laughs> what you can expect to feel and what you can expect to put on there. Um, I did talk to him at uh, at at more length about it and. Um, the as he said in the in his voicemail, the conversion to to a dual disc setup if, if that's not what you already have on that slash seven. Although I feel like an R one hundred slash seven probably already has a dual disc setup. Um, a couple things. It sounds like the conversion is not that difficult to do. You either need another wheel or you need a different hub, which isn't um, a huge deal. Um, I would say that if the if the brakes on your bike feel especially bad, there are some treatments that you can give the current system to make sure that they're that they're okay. You can uh, take a little bit of sandpaper to the, um, to the pads, you know, take, a, just take the brakes apart and, and clean them. You can, um, try to deglaze the rotors a little bit, scrub them with a, a Brillo pad, um, and, uh, you know, flush the, flush the fluid out of the system, look for air bubbles, make sure there's no, you know, make sure that everything's tight and working well for that system. If the brakes still aren't good enough, which they might not be because they're old, um, you can, you know, you could update them to a, a more modern, braking system that uh does not exist necessarily for that um era of motorcycle something outside the scope of what my dad talked about um and that will be more complicated and a little bit more difficult but uh, i did talk to Ari about that uh and he didn't have any specific um jobs that he's done in that vein however he said you know it's basically just running the plumbing running the hardware um you could put different lines different calipers if um uh, on the bike and, or even a different master cylinder. And that'll probably go a long way without having to do anything to the wheel. Yeah. There's a, there's a long story short, Alex, you have a lot of options here. Um, <laughs> and, and honestly, like and drum brakes are one of them. Don't forget <laughs> about that. Um, so I think it's interesting just for people that are listening that aren't really sure exactly, um, what Zach's dad was referring to a lot of brake calipers at this point have multi-pistons in them. And when you pull back on that brake lever, fluid mm -hmm. uh, is is compressed and that pushes the pistons out, which compresses the two pads on a rotor. Having one, a single- one from, one from either side, crucially. Like well, oftentimes one, one from either side. Well, that's what you would ideally want. Or in some cases of a more sophisticated setup, you'd have 
four pistons, you'd have two pistons on either side pressing True, in. true. Yep, yep. Um, like, if this is anything like my old 70s Honda, there was one piston on one side kind of just pushing against a pad on the other side. When your dad mm -hmm. said that that original disc brake setup was a single piston, um, yep. Just so everyone's listening, that's not a lot of pistons. That's not a lot of stopping power. <laughs> so upgrading from that is going to give you tremendous stopping power by comparison. Um, my, my point in, in in kind of where your final question here, Alex, was, you know, do you think it's worth the money uh, and, and do you have problems with this? Like some people say you should never modify a motorcycle. I, I think that in this case, especially, save the old parts. Don't take the old parts off and throw it away. But by all means, if you want better stopping power to enjoy the bike that you just bought and that you own, modify the brakes, get better stopping power out of it. If you ever sell it from a collectability standpoint, you sell it with the original parts still intact. Um, that's mm -hmm. my that's my two cents. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's wise. Um, last thing that I'll point out is if you do upgrade to a to a truly genuinely modern braking system, keep in mind that many of the brake Componentry that is that is marketed or, or sold today um, is sort of built with anti-lock brakes in mind. And your 1978 BMW R100/7 does not have ABS. I don't think. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, I'm not saying that part of the reason the brakes are bad is for safety because that would be a ridiculous thing to say. But just keep in mind that uh, if you were to just put a whatever a 2016 GSXR 750 front brake on your on your uh, uh, on your old BMW, it will be um, you know a, tr a tremendous amount of stopping power. Tremendous amount of stopping power, and the the your older tires, your older chassis, it will there may be some effects there that are um, uh, yeah that would that the company that made the brakes would not be expecting because. That's not the bike it was supposed to be on. So just keep that in mind. That's all. We'll get we'll get we'll get our uh, our editors to throw a legal disclaimer up here that Zach and I are in no <laughs> way <laughs> recommending that you put a Jixer uh, front end brake on your BMW, go out to 100 miles an hour, and just grab a four <laughs> handful or a four finger handful of brakes. That is not right. what we're telling you to do. Indeed. Moving on to comment number five. Um, I like this one a lot. This 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 is going to be this is gonna, we're going to this is going to spark up some fiery debate. I think this comes in from Kyle. Kyle says um, Kyle works at a large airplane manufacturer in, in the Pacific Northwest. Lots of employees, um, which means parking can be a quote adventure. Sometimes mm -hmm. my walk is almost twenty minutes uh, from where uh, Kyle parks to uh, the desk. Great exercise, the Kyle. Great exercise. Great, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, in the summer, Kyle points out, it's great because the motorcycle parking is right outside the door. So, you know, lots of other people ride, um, pull up, they, they take advantage of motorcycle small parking. It's awesome. Um, but because so many people at the company ride, parking can be tight. Here's Kyle's question. Should three-wheelers be allowed to use motorcycle parking? Uh, he points out there occasionally uh, Can-Am Spider um, uh, and, you know, other um, three-wheelers. He also points out... <laughs> That he says is, KTM, and we all get to drink for that. He called yeah, it true. out. That's true. He did. Uh, take a swig when you say KTM. The old high side, low side drinking a, game. A, K, a KTM crossbow, which if you're not familiar with the KTM crossbow, um, it is not really a motorcycle. We'll show it on screen here. Um, but you can also look it up if you like. He says that the KTM crossbow uses the motorcycle parking. And Kyle says to me, if it's got a roof and three wheels, that's a violation. No, no dice. If there's a roof and two wheels, fine. Three wheels, um, but you get wet in the rain, also fine. But if there's a roof and it doesn't tip over when you stop, Kyle says you can't use motorcycle parking. I think this is an interesting question. We talked about our trikes bikes. That was one of the episodes we, we did earlier this, uh, this season. What do you think, Spurge? Where do you draw the line for who gets to use motorcycle parking? The KTM crossbow is not a motorcycle. <laughs> no, it's not. Like, at all. Um, <laughs> so, like, I, I understand what Kyle's kind of getting at here. Um, you know, and he even says, like, three wheels is a violation, roof and two wheels, fine. You know, yeah. Yeah. I, I, he kind of goes back and forth here. I, 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 think, I think he's got a good point. I, I think he's, that— he's, He drew the line, though. He's drawing the line. He says— if you have three wheels but no roof, like if it's if it's a Harley Triglide, you know, it's a Harley Trike or if it's a Can-Am Spider, and you're riding along with three wheels, but when it rains, you get wet. Cool. I'm with you, man. You're a motorcyclist, as far as I'm concerned. You get to park in the in the spot. And then, conversely, if you somehow had a roof and two wheels, which we'll talk about more later, um, 
also cool because you're on two wheels. That's clearly a, a motorcycle and that's how that works. But he draws the line with a roof and more than two wheels. I give, I, I think the fact that he's drawn a lot, I think the fact that he's given trikes a place to park yeah. is, is, is probably more so than it's I would, would, than I would, would really? kind of go along with. I mean, the whole okay. point of motorcycle parking is because it takes up a smaller space. We've argued for, <laughs> you know, advocating for motorcycles to have lower tolls in national parks and lower tolls on, on pay roads because right. it's only two wheels. So, right. If you're starting to add real estate down to how much room you're taking up with the junk you got in your trunk, like uh, then you're you're no longer going to okay. fit into a motorcycle parking spot. So to to Kyle's point, I think he's giving people too much credit. But you go out there, you find that dude with the crossbow, you let the air out of his tires, steal his valve stems, don't slash his tires because that's vandalism. But like, just get a get a go to a go to a, an auto parts store. Get a, a valve stem uh, remover for like three bucks and just take his <laughs> valve stems out and see if he parks there anymore. Speaking of needing legal disclaimers on the screen <laughs> while we're telling people what to do, oh my goodness. Well, Kyle, uh, I know what you want is a strong opinion from us. I, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. It sounds like Spurgeon is is sort of like down with banishing anyone who doesn't fit in a, in a two-wheel parking spot outside of... Uh, but I, I appreciate what you're saying. Like if someone's getting rained on, Maybe they deserve the motorcycle parking. I don't know. I don't know. It's tough. I certainly think that any any true motorcyclist, any any motorcycle with two wheels and no roof should be prioritized in motorcycle parking. That's what feels right to me because of, you know, taking up less space. But I, I appreciate your point of view, Kyle, and I think you're being very inclusive and I think that that's uh I think that that's that's noble. But like yeah. Spurge said, the crossbow, no way. Yeah. Go park somewhere else. I'm willing. I'm willing to see eye to eye on the the Harley Tri Guide, Tri Glide, the trike. We got that in there. I, I under I, and I and I like the theory about like it's about the elements, but you know I still think some of it comes down to the size of the vehicle, and especially with what Kyle's saying here. If you get a roof on there, you're out. So. Well, don't yeah, don't and, don't and, pull any bullshit with the actual crossbow <laughs> owner. I was just that's entertainment value only. I don't need a lawsuit on my hands. Uh, but yeah, KTM crossbow guy, if you're listening to this or girl, like stop using the motorcycle parking. <laughs> I mean, you got four wheels for kind, not even a three wheeler. Sure, yeah. you get wet when it rains, but something tells me you're not driving the KTM yeah, crossbow. So does on somebody the day that... in a Miata that has a broken roof. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, <laughs> exactly right. Okay, well that was fun. Good uh, good question there, Kyle. Uh, let's comment uh, let's number uh, six. This speaking, is another. Yeah, speaking of trikes, yeah. So this is uh, another uh, email that came in around our uh, our trikes bikes season seven episode seven episode, um, and this is about this is from Daniel who wrote in with a bike that wasn't mentioned, and says there's an odd duck of a vehicle that wasn't mentioned, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. It's called a mono tracer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fully enclosed, two-wheeled vehicle. Inside the cabin is climate-controlled handlebars, heated seats, windshield, windshield wiper, etc. Is it a motorcycle? A confused car? An offense against the natural order of things? <laughs> what is it? Zach, what do you think? So, it's, it's very strange. It's, it's, so, if you're not... Um if you're if you're not uh, seeing the the photo that we're putting on screen here in the YouTube video, and you're listening to the podcast, it, it sort of looks like um, it sort of looks like a land speed, like a Bonneville land speed kind of thing, where there's like a, a bubble that you get in and shut the door, and there's little training wheels that come out uh, to to get you going, and then the wheels retract, and then you're and then you're riding a two wheeled, we're riding this little bubble, and and you are. Like like Daniel said, you're enclosed. You got climate control. You're sort of in a car, but you got you got two wheels, so you lean into corners and stuff like that. I don't know what to think of this. To be honest, part of me is intrigued. I don't always love the environment that I'm in when I'm on a motorcycle. I really like piloting the motorcycle. I like uh, uh, leaning into corners, and I like the single track mobility, and I like uh, you know that kind of thing. But sometimes it would be nice to have you know sometimes sometimes you're uncomfortable. You're too warm. You're too cold. Whatever. So you, you, uh, part of my brain is sort of like, yeah, I'm interested. What, like, where, where do I sign up? I get to have two wheels and like lean through corners, but I also can turn on the AC. That sounds, in some ways that sounds pretty good. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't think that, um, let me just say, I don't think it's going to catch on. <laughs> yeah. It looks like if Honda was asked to design a gold wing for like a Wally future, 
Like, uh, <laughs> like that's kind of what this thing re- resembles. Um, mm. I, I, I would say that this is definitely not a trike. Um, True. It's definitely a motorcycle of sorts. It's a, it's a motor. It's a cycle. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I would not call it a trike. I would say it's a motorcycle. And if we're going to say that, Things with hand. I think when we talked in that episode, we kind of all came to the consensus that if it's a handlebar and two wheels, that's a motorcycle. If it had a handlebar and three wheels, that was a motorcycle. So in this case, it's got two wheels and a handlebar. I'd call yeah, this a motorcycle. And and, uh, and based on Kyle's parking rules, he says two wheels and a roof. You're okay to park in the motorcycle parking. I love it. So. We just so solved. We go. solved two problems. If you are the owner of a mono tracer, <laughs> you can park in Kyle's uh, parking lot world for motorcyclists everywhere. And for uh, Daniel, we're we're putting the ruling down. This is the high side, low side uh, ruling. You get the stamp of approval that for all you mono tracer riders out there, you're riding a motorcycle. Yeah, indeed. Okay, moving on. Next comment. Um, this is less theoretical and more practical. Um, this uh, comment comes from Jeffrey Ventura three three eight two on YouTube's, who says um, with regard to the season seven episode four uh, best beginner bikes episode. Um, Jeffrey Ventura says I'm learning motorcycle maintenance and my next task is to lubricate my cables. I've heard everything from WD forty to motor oil to all kinds of specialty products. How do I choose which lubricant to use on my cables. And I just know that Spurgeon Dunbar's got a good answer for this. The important thing is you're thinking about this to begin with. Um, oh, that's that, true. Pat on the back, yeah. Jeffrey. Good I mean, point. The, the fact that you're even thinking about lubricating your cables puts you about a step in the head above the average, uh, the above average motorcyclist out there that probably does nothing uh-huh. to their cables. Um, I know Zach had reached out to, to Ari about this. Ari was saying, you know, you can use everything from, you know, motor oil to WD-40. Those are all acceptable ways to throw no, some... No, don't use WD-40, actually. Oh, he don't? recommended against that. Oh, really? Yeah. Just so no, motor, WD-40, motor no, oil... No, no penetrating lube. No, no, um, nothing, uh, what do you call it? He's used the word caustic, maybe. Nothing um, that has a, a cleanser in it, I believe. Hmm. I forget, I forget what exactly what he said. He said okay. no WD-40, though. The important thing is, um, for you... Uh, Jeffrey Venture, we have an article up on Common Tread. It is mm-hmm. entitled Comparison, Which Motorcycle Cable Lube Tool is the Best for You? And in that, uh, we have a whole bunch of motorcycle, uh, not just tools, but also lubes. The, the real easy here, you know, is yes, if you want to put some, some motor oil down there, you can do it with a plastic bag. The article shows you how. Uh, but honestly, for the amount that you'd be able to get out of this, you can buy a little can of Motion Pro cable lube. And if you want a specialty tool, Motion Pro actually has uh, two different um, cable lubers that you can put onto the cable end itself. You spray the lube right in there, and it just it shoots down. It cleans your cable out. The easier way to do it, or the, the more affordable way to do it, is you can actually zip tie a plastic bag around the end of your cable, spray a bunch of cable lube down there, work the cable back and forth until it works its way all the way through, and then you see it coming out the bottom. Um, so we, we wanted to include this because it is a bit of an educational PSA for those of you out there listening. You do have to lube your cables, uh, especially if you're riding with uh, a slightly older motorcycle that has throttle cables. You know, most of the motorcycles uh, before, I would say, the last 10 years have at mm-hmm. least one, if not two, throttle cables. They send in a return. Um, there's also clutch cables. And, you know, I, I think one of the things that I learned when I was taking my very first motorcycle trip is that carrying a spare clutch cable with you in the event that regular maintenance and lubrication should fail, uh, it's it's an easy way to ensure that you have a, a safe return to your trip. So I always try to carry a spare clutch cable with me if I'm on an adventure. But hopefully that helps to answer your uh, question. Jeffrey, Zach, is there anything you want to throw in there as an extra aside? What's that? What did uh, you say I, to me? I said, is there anything you wanted to add in there uh, as uh, an aside of, of what I threw out already? Nope. I think you covered it quite well. Um, I think, uh, yeah, like like you said, it, it doesn't. It, as long as it's not like a solvent of some kind, um, you can you can put lots of different stuff down there. And that um, that article that Spurgeon mentioned covers the 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 few basic ways to do it from from sort of super shade tree and and uh, the stuff you basically already have in your house <laughs> um, to like sort of uh, something something specialty. But the but 
to Spurge's point also, the fact that you're thinking about it and wanting to do it at all is uh, you get a gold star for the day, Jeffrey. Hot damn. Good for <laughs> you, damn. Jeffrey. Let's move on. Zach, I think comment number eight has your name written all over it. Does it now? Comment number eight comes from Janelle via Electric Mail. I currently ride a 2003 Honda Shadow Sabre 1100 and rode almost 8,000 miles in 2022. Good stuff. But I want to ride more places on my Shadow. Um, I want to ride places on my Shadow that I should not on a Shadow um, off-road, in other words. A test ride on pavement is good, but there are many. Uh, but is there any way for someone to get experience slash time on an ADV dual sport bike without buying one first? I don't have any friends who ride off-road regularly. Um, and those who do uh, have dirt bikes, which I know are different in lots of ways than a, than a dual sport. Um, Janelle said she's looking at the uh, Get On Adventure Fest. It looks like you have to bring your own bike to that. Uh, I don't know why you suggested that this comment would be good for me to answer, <laughs> except that um, riding, uh, you know, test riding ADV or dual sport bikes is definitely hard. Because you brought up the uh, RevZilla's Get On Adventure Fest, Janelle, um, there are demos at those events, which is pretty cool. The the one that Spurgeon and I went to this summer in, in Sturgis, uh, people were riding Aprilia Touaregs around. They were riding um, uh, Zero Tri- DSRX. Tri- Triumph, yeah, Triumph, yeah, Triumph uh, uh, Harley Davidson. Sorry, Triumph Scramblers, um, Triumph Tigers, Harley Pan Ams. Uh, CF Moto was there with a big demo truck of um, and a couple Ibex 800s. Um, so that is a thing you can do. You can go to events and demo. Um, but, um, I think this might be a controversial take, but what I would tell you, Janelle is, um, look around at what, um, so-called experts have said on, uh, you know, about which dual sport you want for which application. And I would say, trust the, the large piece of advice that you get. You know, if you think you want something small, uh, to bop along trails and you don't care about going on the highway, great. If you need something bigger, um, then there'll be a bike suggested for that and i think part of everyone's motorcycle journey will be experimenting with different bikes and to see if you know if you buy a klr 650 because you think it's the right thing for you and then it turns out you want it to be more of a dirt bike or you want it to be more of a touring bike um then you'll learn something and certainly test riding every single bike you want before you buy it is ideal but uh that's just not always feasible i guess yeah i advice. think I, I think you know you you bought a honda shadow put 8,000 miles on it, you're not afraid to say, okay, cool, like what's next? So, yep, you know, yep. getting getting another bike and, and and riding it for a couple thousand miles and saying, you know what, like I like it, I don't like it, let's, let's go back and forth on this. Um, that's obviously an option. I think uh, with, with Get On Adventure Fest specifically, we had tried to make that an event where you could come and test ride off-road and on-road as many adventure bikes as possible because we understand that is a limitation in the segment. Um, for future reference, anybody can come to get on Adventure Fest, even if you're riding a Honda Shadow uh, and ride. <laughs> we have we have street routes yep. that go all day long. So you could uh-huh. ride street routes all day and then go test ride bikes all afternoon. True. Um, but I do think another option here for you is take what, what Zach recommended, do a little bit of research, see which way you're leaning. Uh, maybe it's a KLR 650, maybe it's a Tenere 700, and then use a, a motorcycle rental app to go out and, and try riding yeah, the bike. Idea. Um, Good idea. You can you can often find uh, a peer to peer like Twisted Road motorcycle rental app in your area. You can go to certain locations. I, I believe uh, Eagle Riders Fleet in Las Vegas, for example, has WR two fifties, and I think in California they've got GSs. Um, and, and that's a way where you can go and maybe spend a little bit of money, rent a bike, and have a more personal experience with it. Now. There's going to be limitations as to what those rental places will let you do as far as taking it off-road is concerned. Um, you could also look into like something like MotoQuest where you would take a tour on an adventure bike. And mm-hmm. then also rider training courses. So, for example, Rawhide uh, is the one that most, most quickly comes to mind that has rentals available uh, where you don't have to use your own bike. You can go to uh, a Rawhide course, you can rent a bike, and you can take the, the course where you actually learn how to ride off-road on someone else's motorcycle and get a little taste mm-hmm. of it that way. So the, the point is, Janiel, you've got a lot of options, and, and hopefully that helps to shed some light on some different ways that you could try experiencing an adventure bike outside of you know going to your local dealership and getting a you know five-mile loop of a test ride at best. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, yeah, rentals is a good idea, and, and the training course thing is a good idea too. There are a couple of I know there are a couple of schools. That, Honda has a school in Colton, California, um, that does off road stuff, and you get a bike. You you know you use a bike that they have on on site. Um, Rich Oliver Mystery School they do a intro to off road thing where you just use the bikes they have on on uh, on hand. So yeah, those those are those are all good pieces of advice. Actually, uh, I want I like so Zach just mentioned Rich Oliver's Mystery School. American Super mm-hmm. Camp is another one you can go, and they it's you don't get a big dual sport, but they give you a little you know, 125 yeah. TT to, to learn on, and, and it's a good practice. It is good practice. That is a performance riding school, which I, I'm not, it's not clear to me that Janelle is uh, necessarily uh, interested in that. But point is, schools, training programs, you can look into those, and uh, hopefully that'll help you uh, move all along in your motorcycle journey. And, uh, and, and it sounds like uh, you're logging a lot of miles on that uh, Shadow Saber. So congrats on that, at the very least. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, Zach, you want to take, or no, I guess I'll take uh, comment number nine. Mm. This is Robert, um, who actually uh, has had questions featured in the last mm. three comment episodes. So, Robert, uh, yes. congratulations on uh, number four. You're, you're going for the gold, <laughs> my friend. You're on a streak, yeah. <laughs> um, Robert wrote in and said, thank you for the podcast. Makes me feel like I have a rider community around me, even when riding alone here in Sweden. Um I want to write in with a suggestion for an episode. Love to hear it. it makes our job easier and we don't have to come up with the, uh, the episode ideas. Um, as both a student of history and as a motorcyclist, I can't help but notice that some countries have a much bigger imprint on motorcycling history than others. For example, tiny nations like Austria have more of a storied past than some other much larger nations. Um, mm. Additionally, I was wondering if we could explore what forces drove these industries and why some countries, for example, Spain, produce a lot of off-road makes versus a country like Italy, which has so many on-road and tarmac racing marquees or marks. Mm. Well, that's a great question, Robert. And I'd like to move on to comment number 10 <laughs> at this point. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, this is a this is a good this is a good question. This you might say would be a whole other podcast because you could talk about why these things happened and what sort of um, you know environmental forces or societal winds blew the industrial <laughs> currents in a certain direction. You know, um, because it is curious, right? That that um, certain countries have done certain things. Some of it's some of it probably has to do with the. The type of riding or the type of environment that the country offers, but I'll, I'll, I'm sure a lot of it has to do with business and importing and exporting and stuff like that. And I don't have the answer. Yeah, but I think our point, Robert, is that this is something for us to scratch our heads about, mm, uh-huh. um, and potentially this will be a future episode. Uh, obviously, one that would be a little bit more research intensive for Zach and for myself, but definitely something to uh, to consider. So yeah. Oh, with that's that actually, being said, good. Well. Um, I, I am reminded of a, of an article that um, that my uh, that I remember my dad pointing out years and years ago in in road racing world that um, that a guy wrote called why do at the time there were um, Triumph was making a 600 cc super sport bike the bike bikes sort of eventually became the 675 Daytona uh, three cylinder bike but at the time it was a four cylinder. Uh, I think it was called the TT 600, maybe or 600 TT, something like that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, Triumph and the Japanese manufacturers, Honda, Suzuki, Yamaha, and Kowalski, were the only other manufacturers making four-cylinder sport bikes. The article was entitled "Why Do Island Why Are Only Island Nations Making Four-Cylinder Sport Bikes?" In other words, Japan and Great Britain, for some reason, were the only places that four-cylinder sport bikes were coming from in the world. Probably just a coincidence. However, speaks to your point, Robert. Why? How did that end up? How did that end up being the case? That, well, that what's those, funny is that the, the first the, the that, first one to break it was Triumph when they relaunched their Daytona as a triple engine with the 675 because they said, you know what? We're going to make a better all-around motorcycle. We're not going to just <laughs> play to these rules that have been, you know, ar- archaic. And True. And it yeah. changed. It changed the way that Triumph's whole line moved forward from that point out. And the original sure. Daytona 675 was a phenomenally uh, impressive motorcycle. True. Very true. Anyway, that's a great question, Robert. Um, and we will probably work on that more. And we'll get back to you. We'll get back. Maybe to in you. season eight. We'll send you. We'll send you a letter <laughs> in the mail. So yeah, exactly. we'll, we'll get on that. So exactly. before we go any further, um, we're going to take a quick break. 
uh, for a word from our sponsor, Motul, and then we'll be back with more of your comments. Mm. Okie dokie, everybody. We are back with the uh, listener comment episode of High Side, Low Side. We are on comment number 10, Spurgeon mm. Dunbar. Um, this comes in from Woody via email. Woody says, I'm one of those guys that listens to the podcast even though I don't own a bike. Always, uh, always a pat on the back as far as we're concerned. Woody continues to say, I'm 20 and broke-ish but want a Honda Rebel 500 as my first bike. My question to you is, should I save up and buy a used one when I have the money or say screw it and go get one from a dealership? What are the pros and cons of each and what do you recommend for a broke-ish 20-year-old? Well, I think this is, good, this is a good question for you, Spurge. Yeah, I guess my question is, is do we want to uh, lead right in with the first part of comment 11 and answer these together? Would that make the most sense? Um, sure. Just yeah. thinking about, because what we try to do is we, we did get some similar questions throughout this episode. So what Zach and producer Chase and I tried to do was link these together. And so comment 10 um, with Woody about the um, buying his first Honda Rebel 500 ties in with Alex's comment. Uh, at least the first part, which is the only thing we're going to focus on right now. And Alex says, I I'm thinking about trading my MT-10 or my MT-07 for a street triple. And while I can afford to pay outright, uh, it would hurt much less up front to finance the difference. Uh, have you ever financed a bike before? Is it a dumb thing to do? Would you ride a finance bike on a track or wait until it's paid off? So I'm going to start by saying all of this is open for debate and the internet is going to be rife with people telling us that we are wrong no matter what we say. Um, uh -huh. I will say that have I financed a bike before? Every single one of my motorcycles I've financed. A lot of people will say you shouldn't do that. You should pay in cash. I don't agree with that. Uh, and I will do some very loose math here to explain the reasons why, but I'm also recognizing this is not a financial advice podcast, and frankly, you should look <laughs> elsewhere for you know, your financial advice. But up until recently, you could get a motorcycle loan for about 2.5% if you had good credit. Um, and if your money, your cash on hand was invested elsewhere, like a mm -hmm. 401k, for example, and that 401k, 401k was returning at 9 or 10 or 12%, um, the, you were actually losing money if you would have just gone out and bought that motorcycle in cash uh, because that motorcycle is going to begin to depreciate versus taking out a low interest loan on it making payments and then using that extra money to put into other investments. That is uh, one way of looking at it. That's the way that I would look at it. But if you're also somebody that would just take that extra cash and go buy another toy, uh, then you're not <laughs> going to reap that potential benefit. I, I think that the general point of view here is that, at least in my opinion, and I'm not going to speak for Zach, Motorcycle financing is not a dumb thing to do. I don't think that financing a motorcycle is something that should be frowned upon if that's the way that you want to pay for it. Like I said, the only way that I could afford my first motorcycle, as well as my most recent motorcycle, uh, is to finance it. You know, these these are expensive toys. When I was in college, my Bonneville was seven thousand dollars. I had a thousand dollars, and I had a good job where I, I was able to make the monthly payment of 120 bucks every month. And I made double payments when I could, and I paid it off early. Um, and then for my most recent bike, which was the KTM 890, that was an expensive motorcycle. I didn't have that kind of cash sitting around that I wanted to just dump on a bike. So I put an amount down and, and I pay an amount every month. And like I said, that one was locked in at like two and a half percent. So even over the course of a five-year loan on that, it's 700 something dollars in interest over the course of five years. Now that's where I think the debate comes in where people say, well, you're stupid for doing that because you know, <laughs> you've got to you know, pay off an extra $700 to the price of the bike. I, I, again, I'm not going to get into that, but I, I think that for me, I don't think there's anything wrong with financing a motorcycle. So let's just I take a pause right there. Zach, what do you think? <laughs> I think, um, yeah, to, to, to hit some highlights there and just sort of touch on some of the um, the things that might be most pertinent to you, Woody. The first question that we that we um, that we addressed here and we read out loud about buying a, a, the broke twenty year old who wants to buy a Rebel five hundred. Ultimately, it's what you're comfortable with, right? Um, so if you're gainfully employed and you and it's, it seems like the you know, financing a bike is totally reasonable because you have steady income and and you can apply some of um, uh, Spurgeon Buffett's financial advice there. Um, then, 
then then yeah, I don't I don't think there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Uh, if you're the type of person who who is a you know whatever a seasonal worker, you have you have you have influxes of cash and and then not so much, and you just feel a lot more comfortable if you could bundle together your however many thousands of dollars, buy a motorcycle, own it, and just have it be done right there. Then if that speaks to your personality, that that makes that makes total sense too. There's not I don't think that um, I don't think that either one is wrong. Um, I just- uh, I. I think that I would say, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend, I, in fact, I've never recommended <laughs> someone to go and finance a brand new motorcycle as their first bike. My advice always as a first bike is buy something. If you have a dream bike, you like, oh, I really want a Honda Rebel 500 or I really want a Ducati Monster. Buy the cheap, crappy used version of that that you can find for less money ride around on that, decide whether you think you like it. If you tip it over in a parking lot, who cares? It was three grand instead of 10 grand, whatever it is. Um, and you'll be happier doing that. That's always, that's historically been my advice. Um, but plenty of people go and, and buy their, buy their first bike brand new and have a good experience with it. So I think it, I think, I think you bring up a good point, um, that is important to note. And I think Woody, for you specifically, if you're asking financial advice from Zach Quartz and myself, uh, you you might you might um, you might have more questions than we have answers in the time <laughs> allotted for this comment. But I will say that for those of you listening that have never financed anything before, it's not like you just go and magically get financed. You have to be approved. You have to have credit. You have to have a credit check. So for for you, Woody, as a as a broke. 20 year old, um, <laughs> you know, Zach talked about gainful employment, regular, regular paychecks. You know, you, if you don't have any kind of credit established or built up, you might not be able to finance a motorcycle. They might, uh-huh. uh, because a motorcycle Good getting, fi- getting a motorcycle finance. And I, and I learned this at the dealership level. Um, we would have sold twice the amount of motorcycles, you know, that we did if we could have gotten everybody financed, but motorcycle financing is a bit trickier in the United States than, than car financing. It's a little bit easier to finance a car because it's seen a little bit more as a necessity and not as a toy. Mm. Um, so, you know, if you are looking at potentially financing a motorcycle one day or financing any vehicle one day, and this is to anyone out there in their late teens or early twenties, you know, establishing good credit habits now it's never too late for that. Getting a, a, a low threshold credit card, making those monthly payments, making sure you're not racking up debt, all ways that you can help to establish credit so that if you do want to go finance a bike at some point in time, uh, you have that credit already established and in good standing. Mm-hmm. So I think um, as it pertains to um, Alex's uh, question, which was the second question about financing. Um, Alex has an MT-07 from Yamaha, would like to buy a Triumph Street Triple upgrade uh, to a larger uh, naked sport bike, um, and said, is financing a bike a dumb thing to do? I think Spurgeon covered that. No, it's not outright a dumb thing to do. Um, but I think ultimately it's what you're comfortable with and what seems like it makes the most sense for your own financial situation and um, and your own psyche you know some people just do better with debt than others do um so that's a it's important to kind of gauge gauge your own um kind of tolerance and uh and ability to have that um to have that debt would you finance a would you ride a finance motorcycle on the track or would you wait until it's paid Mm. off zach quartz would i ride a finance motorcycle on the track that's a difficult question for me to answer um i so unlike spurgeon i have never financed uh, a vehicle ever. <laughs> um, I've never like the, the only couple of motorcycles I've ever bought, I bought outright, uh, and I own them and, uh, my truck I bought outright, no financing. Um, my, we, this earlier this year, my wife and I bought a car, family car, same thing, didn't finance it. So I don't know that this is sort of like my inclination. That's how I operate. Um, I don't think really that it should matter whether the bike is financed or not. Take it to a track day. It's your vehicle that you have purchased. The only thing that can sometimes uh, throw a, a wrench in the gears, and Spurgeon, you'd have to speak to this because I don't actually know, but certain situa- doing certain things to your motorcycle, whether it's taking the exhaust off and putting a new one on or, or you know, like whatever, doing certain work to your motorcycle or taking to certain situations can void sections of or the entire warranty. Is that accurate? Warranty... Potentially, but not, but not, not, it wouldn't have any effect on financing. I know it wouldn't have any effect on, on finances. All I'm saying is that there are other things like you can't expect, um, any 
incident at the racetrack or any any sort of um, any uh, yeah anything that happens on the racetrack or because you're taking the bike to track days, uh, whether it's like safety wiring or like having to modify the bike a little bit to go on the track, stuff like that. I just don't want to say a blanket statement and say like, whatever, take your finance bike to the track and then have someone say, oh, I didn't realize that that was going to change my you know agreement with the dealership in general right. um, or, or factory warranty or something like that. So just that's something to keep in mind. As far as risk is concerned, it's your motorcycle. Take it to the track. Who cares? If you crash it, you're going to have to fix it same as you would on the street. Yeah, you're gonna uh, the, the, you're gonna have to fix it. You're gonna keep making those payments either way. You know, right. if you bought that bike outright in cash, then the cash is gone. If you are financing it over <laughs> three or five years, you're just parsing that payment out over a set amount of time. But either way, if you crash it, you're responsible for it. I think the note here uh, for you, Alex, is that, and it's probably a good reminder for people out there. There's certain limits of insurance you have to have if you are financing a motorcycle. If you are uh, okay. a Zach Quartz, really you know, yeah, if, if you're Zach Quartz and you're just out paying for everything with handfuls of, of, of greenbacks, <laughs> then you don't have to worry about carrying uh, a level of insurance that as long as it meets the state threshold in which you're living in. But if you're financing a vehicle, you have to carry a higher level of insurance because the bank wants to make sure that they're paid back. So my note for you, Alex, is make sure that the insurance that you have on the bike allows for track use. And, and a lot of times, um, as long as you are going to a track day as an educational learning tool, as a uh, as a, a benefit, like I know that there's certain insurance companies out there that look at a track day as a, you know rider training, and they actually encourage that because it makes you a better rider. Um, but you just need to make sure that you have coverage for your motorcycle if you're going to use it in that kind of a situation. That's the biggest, that's the biggest thing that I would be aware of whether you pay for the bike outright or if you are, um, you know, financing the motorcycle. Well, that's much more in depth than I thought we were going to get on that question, to be honest. And uh, we obviously don't want to force our opinions or our lifestyles on anyone. So I think. Uh, but I think it's a good I, split, I like, right? Like I have is, no yeah, problem yeah, financing totally. a motorcycle. Zach yep. prefers to pay cash. So sure. even even with the high and side, we low can side be hosts, friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the second, so Alex, the the uh, Alex wrote in asking about. Um, riding a finance bike on the track and is it dumb to finance a bike? Alex's second part of the question um, that they submitted was, do you think crashing at the track is an inevitability? Obviously related to the riding the finance bike on the track. Um, and uh, I don't know, what do, you, what, do you, what do you think about that, Spurge? So, you, so we've, we've said, no, sure, ride your finance bike on the track, who cares, whatever, it's your bike, you gotta fix it anyway, either way, who cares? Um, for someone thinking about going to a track day with their with a bike that they've purchased outright or they finance whatever it may be, um, how how likely should they be, or how 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 much should they expect to crash at a track day? I opinion? think it I think it depends on the kind of rider you are, um, and, and this is something <laughs> where I, I've often I. I I've made the mistake of not listening to my own advice. I, I think for, for years, I told people, go to the track, take your time, you use it. The only person you're there competing against is yourself. Use it to learn how to be a better rider. Um, you know, and, and then <clears throat> I went out, I remember with most recently with a Ninja 400 and started getting excited too early and low-sided <laughs> through a chicane. You know, and I was like, well, that I should have taken my time and let the tires warm up and warmed up to the day. And now on the first session, I'm, you know, repairing Woodcraft rear sets on the side of the, the track. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to say that it's inevitable, but if you're going to a track day to push your skills and to push your limits and to see where that threshold is. And the reason that we go to do that at a track is because while crashing at a track might not be inevitable the risk is usually typically lower because there's runoff, there's not trees, there's not wildlife. Um, you can mitigate some of that risk. But I, I do think that if you are pushing yourself and testing the limits in a safe place like a racetrack, you could potentially end up being more likely to crash than otherwise. In to, my to put it another way, it is not inevitable that you will crash at a track day. Mm -hmm. However... You should ask yourself why you're going to the track, what the what the point is of going to the track. If it's like Spurgeon said, to push the limits of yourself and the motorcycle, then you're you're increasing your chances of crashing a lot. The reason that it's a good idea to go to a, a track day is that that is absolutely the right place to crash if you're going to do it, <laughs> is the point. If you if you if you are if you are interested in flirting with the the edge of your own ability or your motorcycle's ability, then that's the place to do it. Um, you know, 
can if you told yourself you wanted to go to a track and and not tip over would that be possible yeah 100 uh, i don't think it's inevitable at all um, but it, it does to spurgeon's original comment it matters a lot your own mindset as you go into it some people go there thinking like this is going to be awesome i'm going to the trampoline park and i'm going to you know flip over ass over tea kettle and it's not going to make a difference which is not a terrible attitude to have in the context of riding motorcycles because like i said crashing into racetrack is the right place to do it but you know it, it just totally depends on your outlook um uh, so i know that that's that's a little bit of a that's a little bit of a lame answer but i i stand by it <laughs> have you ever have you ever crashed a racetrack zach are you zero for zero <laughs> have i ever crashed at a racetrack is that the question yeah <laughs> Oh yes, I have. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but I yeah. raced at racetracks also, and like there when you're go. racing, it's a totally different thing. Um, it's a it's a very different outlook. That that's like if you're not if you if you never crash over the course of a race weekend or, or over a course of a racing career, you're arguably not trying hard enough. <laughs> uh, that's a different that's a different mindset though. But it's funny because <laughs> there was a recent. Uh, and I'll keep this very vague for legal reasons. Uh, there was a recent <laughs> experience where Zach and Spencer and I uh, were spinning lap times and we were competing against one another, not in head-to-head <laughs> combat, but in, no, in, no. T- time in, time, in time trial laps. And a- at first I was like, I was just kind of like putting around and having a good time. Um, and then all of a sudden uh, I started realizing that I was more competitive than I thought I was. And I started pushing <laughs> the bike harder than I thought right, to try right. and catch up to uh my colleagues if you will and i remember pulling zach aside afterwards i was like i didn't know that about myself now i now i've learned i'm probably a little more competitive than i thought i was and i think it it ties into this right like if you go to a track day and you're you're all of a sudden you're within a second or you're 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 seeing yourself get a little bit faster now all of a sudden you're gonna just like something clicks in your brain and you're like i can do it i can get one second faster than i did before (laughs) totally totally totally. yeah it's a it's a it's a it's a wild uh wild drug in, in your head that goes off there. It's pretty interesting. All right. Um, comment number 12, moving yeah, what are, right where, along. Where are we here? I'm trying to, yeah, this yeah, is right. Eric. Uh, comment number 12 <laughs> says, um, Eric, thank you for writing in, uh, says, I, I've been riding on road for a little over a year now. Early in my on road career, I decided to get into track days. They were super fun and I loved it until. I was taken out in a novice group by a rider who rode directly into the back of me at about 60 miles an hour. Uh, After this quote-unquote off at the racetrack, I lost my confidence and I sold my track prepped SV650. After an accident, how do you build confidence to get on the bike and have fun again as opposed to just worrying? How, How do you not worry? (laughs) <laughs> that's a that's a big question, Eric. It's a big question. Uh, I, I think that there's a this is this is hard. I think there's a lot of things that we do as motorcyclists to rationalize the activity that we participate in, right? There's there's like some people just ignore it. Some people just ride down the freeway, they ride down a twisty road, they ride around a motocross track, they ride um, down a trail in the woods, they ride on a racetrack, they ride in whatever environment it might be. And they tell themselves, it won't happen to me. I'm not, I'm not at risk. I'm paying attention. Um, it, they just sort of like choose not to think about that. Um, and I think that's the wrong attitude to have. I think it's very, it's, it's smart, if not crucial to remember that what you're participating is, is a, is a dangerous activity, regardless of what, environment you're in what environment you're riding a motorcycle um so there should there's a healthy amount of worry is what i'm trying to say here um if you have had one incident at a racetrack where someone hit you uh and you have decided that that activity doesn't feel like what you want to do then that's also and like i this isn't what we want to cover in general on high side low sides (laughs) not not advice we want to dole out but if you don't want to do it anymore because you don't feel safe and that that experience is not something that you are willing to risk happening again um, for the for the sort of um, uh, uh, joy or exhilaration or pleasure you get from participating in the activity, then I think there's only one answer: you don't do it anymore. Right? That that'd be the advice that I would that I would give. So I I understand where Zach's coming from on this, 
And I think that it's a, it's the right first part of the answer of, of like, we're not <laughs> going to tell anybody to put themselves back into a situation where Correct. they don't feel comfortable. Um, and, and Zach and I love motorcycles. We love them on road. We love them off road. And, and, and I, I think we too, you know, wrestle with this sometimes with our own personal uh, acceptance yeah. of how much risk we're willing to take. What I would say to you, Eric, and I'll speak specifically to, well, to crashes that I've had. I, I've crashed on the street, uh, or not on the street, but on, on a road racing track. And I had a lot of struggle with trusting the front wheel again. And, you know, really what what helped me overcome that and, and put faith back in was just getting back on the horse and getting back out there. Now, I didn't get back on and go out and turn the same lap times that I did three sessions earlier. It, it's, it scared me, it rattled me, and it, and it, it knocked me down a few pegs. Um, and it took getting back out there and slowly building back up to build that confidence back. Um, and it was something that that was important for me to go right back out again and, and to just kind of look that in the eye. Now, Eric, you didn't tell dog. us. But yeah, but Eric didn't tell us how severe his crash was. Right. You know, well, the, but the, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I, and I don't want to I don't want to bogart the, the whole narrative here, but we should. It's important to say that Eric point out that Eric was hit by another rider. Sure. Uh, and 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 taking Eric's word for it, Eric didn't do anything wrong. He was just sure. riding along, and someone else made a mistake and and hit Eric. Um, this reminds me of um, a non motorcycling story that my uh, that my aunt told me. Uh, my aunt moved in the nineties and went to Columbus, Ohio, uh, because of my uncle's job. Um, she at one point told the the uh, some of the other moms in her affluent neighborhood, "I'm going to take my kids down to the museum. We're going to take the um, the bus or the train or whatever it is in Columbus down. To, we're going to go to this museum in some part of town." And one of the other moms said, "You can't. You shouldn't go to the that place. You, that place downtown or near that place downtown. Someone got shot there, at like one, what, a couple years ago or whatever. Like that's not a place I would ever bring my children." And my aunt's reaction was, "Honey, I grew up in New York City. If I never went somewhere, someone got shot, I wouldn't leave my house. That's not how I operate in my life. So, obviously." This is on a sliding scale. You have you have to make your own decisions here. But what I want to point out to you, Eric, is that you didn't do anything wrong. You can worry about other people hitting you if you want to. Um, but it's not like Spurgeon. Spurgeon went into a corner too fast and lost the front end. He had to talk to himself about how he felt about how much to trust the front tire now that he had made that mistake. You didn't make a mistake, Eric. You just you just got hit by lightning. And that 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 can happen sometimes. I can't tell you if you go back to the racetrack, you're not going to get hit by another rider again. But uh, but I I think you should remember that when thinking about your own confidence that you didn't do anything incorrect. <laughs> yeah, and 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 again to my point about Eric's injury, like we don't know if Eric sustained injuries or or if it, it knocked him down a few pegs just in, in his in his personal health. But like it, it comes back to Zach's original point. It, it comes down to what you're willing to to accept moving forward. Um, you know, I, I, I walk with a limp on a rainy day now because I've, I've damaged my <laughs> knees so badly in off-road ride, riding and, and racing and crashing that it, it, it's something that carries with me. But I, the, the thought of not doing that is not acceptable to my brain, and I don't know how to turn that off. What I will say as a, as a closing thought for you, Eric, is, you know, because you left this with like, how do you build the confidence back up and have fun without worrying? Part of it is just getting back on the bike. And part of it is realizing that this freak accident might not happen again, or it might happen again, or you, you just got to get back on the bike. And to mitigate that risk, there are more safety mechanisms out there than ever before. You can get an airbag suit uh, for mm -hmm. the track. You can get knee braces if you're riding off road. You can get neck braces. You can get helmets that have three different layers of high, low, and mid-speed impact with rotational uh, protection. You look at what Bell's doing with their Race Star line of helmets, or you look at what Alpine Stars is doing with their airbag suits. The technology is better than ever for safety. Now, there's a sliding scale of how much you want to spend for how much risk you want to mitigate, and I understand that. But, you know, I'll, I'll give you one little anecdote, and I'll leave it with this, Eric. Is I had a I had a really close friend reach out to me and say I, I want to get an airbag jacket for riding on the street, and and I said, oh, interesting. Like, is it is it for any particular reason? He goes, well, um, you know, I my my wife would feel more comfortable, and and it just would it would help us in our relationship if I had a, an airbag jacket to wear because that would leave her with more confidence that you know I was being safer, and this is this is what we've decided in our relationship that is going to move forward. And that was, you know, a, a risk that they were mitigating together and it, and it instilled a little bit of confidence in both parties. And I think for you, Eric, you know, if there's something externally 
that will help you. In addition to the fact, like Zach said, this wasn't your fault. You know, accidents do happen that sometimes aren't your fault. Um, maybe that's something to consider too, is, is the different safety elements that are external that you can add into your repertoire uh, that might help. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, for what it's worth, I'm pulling for you, Eric. I hope that you that you get back on the get back on the bike and get your confidence back up, and it, and it all works out. I hope that um, anything that we had to say helped at all. <laughs> Moving along to uh, more, uh, this is perhaps a more controversial mm. comment, Spurge. Um, this comes in uh, from. Let's see here. <laughs> Uh, Bean with Bacon Mega Rocket on YouTube. <laughs> Say that 10 times fast. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> this person says, big disagree with this idea of starting on small bikes at the track. People talk about how, quote, more horsepower covers up your mistakes and save you as if people are chasing lap times. Even on a larger bike, you can tell when you brake too early. You can tell when you didn't carry enough corner speed. You can tell when you're in the wrong gear and exit. Additionally, small bikes can develop bad habits because you can whack the throttle open whenever you want without any risk of going sideways because it's got such little power. Same idea for brakes in most cases. And it sucks getting blown by in every straightaway by inline fours like you're standing still. Um, someone who's been riding for 15 years and has a 650 as a daily rider um, should be on something just as big for the track, in my opinion. Not all inline or V4 uh, not an inline four or V4, but definitely something more than a Ninja 400. Other than figuring out specific corners and getting comfortable leaned over, riding an R3 at the track did nothing to help my own development before getting on a street triple R, which is a Triumph uh, uh, naked bike there with a, say, 100 horsepower. So, no small bikes at the racetrack, bad idea, Spurgeon. What do you have to say about that? You know what's really cool? <laughs> I get it. Getting past in a straightaway, speech. yeah. Getting past in a straightaway <laughs> uh, on a, on a small bike because the person blowing by you is only sophisticated enough to hold the throttle wide open in a straightaway. That yeah, I, I can see how that's kind of you know rough. But then when you pass them in a corner because you've actually built up the skill to do so, like that feels <laughs> pretty good too. Um, I, I, I'm going to let you actually didn't did, let's let's make a comment tread reference, Zach. Zach, right. Zach recently did an article called Brain Processing at Speed, a Test of Two Ninjas. And I'm wondering if in this course of this test and writing this article, Zach, if you have any opinions or thoughts. Um, and to give a bit of a, a, pro, a, a backstory here, Zach basically took, um, I believe it was a, a Ninja 1000. Is that correct? A ZX-10. Uh, a, a ZX-10 and, mm -hmm. and, and a Ninja 400 and, yep. and rode them both side by side at, at a racetrack to kind of figure out the different effects. And Zach, why don't you share a little bit of what you've learned? Uh, yeah, so I, I rode a, a ZX-10, you know, approximately 200 horsepower um, sport bike, you know, cutting edge flagship sport bike from Kawasaki. And I rode a Kawasaki Ninja 400, which is a 40, 45 horsepower entry level sport bike from Kawasaki, right? And I mounted a GoPro on the gas tank of each bike. I did uh, a bunch of laps and then I selected one sort of like clean, uh, average lap from each bike. And then I broke down each lap into segments on the 400 CC bike and on the thousand CC bike, uh, to try to understand how much of the lap was spent on the brakes, how much of the lap was spent on the throttle, how much of the lap was spent trying to control how much horsepower I was delivering to the racetrack. Um, and then when I broke down those segments, I then, um, reached out to a couple of, um, uh, neuroscientists. One of them was a, uh, psychologist. Was it, um, uh, something to do with adaptive psychology, something like that, about how the brain processes things that it sees. And then another one was a, was a neuroscientist from um, University of Trondheim in Norway. And I asked them about how the brain, because, yeah, how, how the brain processes all of the information that it sees at speed to try to understand why it feels like it's harder for me to ride a fast bike than a quote-unquote slow bike. Um, the, the, the Cliff's notes here are that... Um, your brain only has um, a certain amount of neurons for um, transmitting information from your eye to your brain um, for certain speeds that you that you see, and something called optic flow, which is when you are an object moving through space, which is like the um, the the imagery that your eye is taking in. Uh, flows around your eyeball. So that's why things at the edges of the frame look like they're moving faster than things in the center of the frame. This is the, this is the world sort of flowing around your, your eye optically. That process 
transmits uh, information to your brain and, and the faster you go, the less of your brain is capable of taking that in essentially because human beings, the way we've evolved, have not been able to go very fast for very long, right? So we don't have, uh, we're not used to processing very, very high speeds. So like in the test that I did on the straightaway at the track that I was at, I went hundred miles an hour on the Ninja 400 and I went 150 miles an hour top speeds on the ZX-10. All of that information is just harder to process when you're moving faster. And not to mention, you have less time to process it at all, right? Because when you're going 150 miles an hour, you have less time to figure out uh, what decision to make next than when you're going 100 miles an hour. So the, the whole, the problem com uh, compounds. And ultimately, I think that this, uh, the person who wrote in this comment on YouTube um, makes some valid points about how you can tell if you've braked too early on a on a thousand cc bike, you can tell if you're in the wrong gear on a thousand cc bike. You absolutely can. The, those things are true. It will be more evident on a slower bike, and your brain will have more time to react, and it'll have more time to process all the information that it's taking in, and it'll be easier to learn. And ultimately, when you do learn to really extract the maximum amount of potential out of that small motorcycle, then when you get on a larger motorcycle, you will be better at the things that the small motorcycle taught you. That's the whole small bikes on a racetrack uh, kind of in a nutshell. And, you know, it's a free country. So if you, wanna, if you wanna take a 200 horsepower bike to the track and tell yourself that you're learning all the same things you would on a slow bike, you can do that if you want to. Um, I will disagree with you though. I will disagree with you as well. I think Zach, I, I don't, I, I think Zach, that answer probably sums up anything that I could have said much more concisely and, and articulate. Um, uh, we've done both. Right. And I think especially right. for myself, I'm, I'm much more of an intermediate track level rider than Zach is. Zach's just been doing this for a lot longer and he's a lot more at home on the track. And I think that for our advice for people out there that are thinking about doing their first track day, or they're thinking about getting into riding on a track, you can get in way over your head, you know, uh, being with bacon, mega rocket, uh, talks about, you know, a street triple R like even with a street triple R at 115 horsepower, if you're, if you realize that you didn't break soon enough, <laughs> you're going to be in much, uh, dire, you're going to have much dire consequences than if you realize that you didn't break soon enough on a, on a smaller, on a smaller bike, just from a processing standpoint and, and from a mm -hmm. weight standpoint, from a speed that you're carrying standpoint. So I, I think that yes, you can go out and get a SV650 or a street triple R, and that could be a potential great first track day for an individual out there. But I think as a blanket recommendation for us on high side, low side, um, starting smaller, getting comfortable and working your way up because part of the thing, you know, I, one of the comments that old uh, Bean with Bacon makes here is getting past is uncomfortable. You should learn that. And and whether you're learning that getting past is <laughs> right. uncomfortable on a small bike or a big bike, like, doesn't matter. You need to get comfortable on a racetrack with people blowing by you, with people being around you, and you need to learn to not be startled with that. And whether you're learning that on a, on a, a big bike or a small bike, you're going to learn it either way. Um, so I, I think <laughs> sure. that some of that, some of that is you just have to get used to as a track rider. Last thing I'll throw out there is that uh, you do this, you go to track down a smaller bike, you're going to spend less money on gas, less money on tires, less money on the bike to begin with. Um, it's just like a, it's an easier uh, financial, it's less financial strain uh, initially. Um, but I think that the, I think that the, I, I appreciate, I will say this, I appreciate what, um, what uh, being with Bacon Mega Rocket has pointed out uh, that, um, that, you know, they feel like they are, uh, better off on a bigger bike and they can learn all the same things. Um, and I, I think that the, the, um, <laughs> the, the, the general feeling among, uh, motorcycle, um, pundits and enthusiasts is the opposite, but you know, this, this, this is why it's a big, beautiful world. You know, people got lots of opinions. And we, and we wanted to highlight one that disagreed with us. Not everybody yeah, yeah, agrees absolutely. with everything Zach and I have to say. And, and we want you to know that whether you agree with us or disagree with us, we all are playing on the same team, uh, which is to try and have fun on two wheels. So thank you so much, Bean with Bacon Mega Rocket, for writing in. And let's move on to comment uh, number 14. Uh, and this is a question for Zach. However, Spurgeon might have an opinion too, mm -hmm. is what Matt writes in his email. Says, if you could pick 
one bike from any CTXP episode to complete all of the CTXP episodes with, other than the sidecar, <laughs> which one would it be? So the question is, you have to complete every single CTXP episode, which has been 10 or 15 now. I don't actually know how many there are. A few. Uh, a few. And you have to pick one bike. That's what I have to do. I don't even really remember what all we've done. We've ridden across Wyoming. We've ridden across Alaska. We've for those of you that for those of you that, of you that ridden, don't know, Zach, it, Zach is part of a. We have a larger program here called <laughs> CTXP, which is the Common Trade Experience Program. Uh, we release four episodes typically a year. They are large scale adventures on motorcycles on our YouTube channel. The episodes are anywhere from thirty five minutes to fifty minutes long. And it's been everything and anything that you could possibly do on two wheels right. in an adventure. <laughs> I, I, I like to think so. Um, we did an episode where we compared a BMW Cruiser to a Harley Davidson adventure bike. Uh, sorry, a BMW, yeah, Cruiser to a Harley Davidson adventure bike. And then talked about BMW adventure bikes and Harley Davidson Cruisers. Because it seemed like, you know, each one is drinking the other one's milkshake. Kind of. Mm. Um, it was not one of our more popular episodes, uh, but uh, it was an interesting experiment, I thought, I still think. Um, it included a late model BMW R1250 GS, and uh, I think that's the bike that I'm going to choose. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of a loophole if, there. I see what you did. If, you ha if I had to ride across Alaska, ride across Wyoming, ride around a racetrack, ride, uh, what else have we done? Ride through the mountains of California. Um, Ride, like, see which bike would go fastest on a straight section of road versus what it could do around a racetrack. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think of all the different scenarios that I've been in, but I would choose a, I would choose an R1250 GS. That's the bike that I would choose. If I had to choose any of the machines that we've sort of curate, uh, created or curated on on the um, on the program, I might go with. Uh, I'd have to go with Dave the Jixer. Dave the Jixer is a 2006 GSX-R1000 that we have now used to, um, to attack a racetrack and also to tow a trailer on a camping trip. Would I ride Dave the Jixer across Alaska? Yeah, sure. Why not? Put some knobby tires on Dave. I'll take it. <laughs> well, you're a braver man than I because I'm thinking about the <laughs> Wyoming trip. Um, that and would be also pretty miserable. Oh, yeah, I suppose a dual sport would be a good idea too. I was thinking about this and I've actually been fortunate enough to ride a few of the motorcycles or unfortunate enough, depending on how you want to look at this, <laughs> um, that, uh, Ari and, and Zach have created. And I, if I was going to go with one that you guys have laid your hands on, uh -huh. it would actually be the battle toad. Uh, the battle toad is a versus oh, right. 650. Um, yeah. I have that, that usually ends up being the bike that I ride when I go out to visit Zach and Ari <laughs> in sunny California. Cause it's the one yeah. that's usually just sitting there with keys in it. Um, <laughs> and in our varying states of disrepair in the times that I've ridden it, uh, we've taken it to get on adventure fest. I've helped Zach try to fix a flat in the side of the trail, but somebody didn't bring the right tools to remove the wheel. Getting back to the episode or the, the comment that started this about how to fix a tire on the side of the trail. Right. Um, the only other one I could think of, and I think this speaks to uh, my track ability as well, would be the CRF 300 L um, because that bike was actually really fun on the go-kart track. I uh -huh. mean, it probably would be a little bit limited, with maybe some of the more high end speed tests that you've done. But like when I think about the, the, the Texas rodeo and, and being able to maneuver that bike around True tight corners. police bike rodeo. I forgot about that. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Battle toads, a good choice, man. Yeah. And it's, it's, I'm looking at it right now. It's got knobby tires on it. So it's ready for an off-road adventure sort of. And, uh, and you could do any, any and all things with it. And it costs us 800 bucks. So it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a, it's 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 a smart choice from a financial standpoint as well. All right, that was a, that was a fun little uh, fun little comment there. Thank you, Matt, for sending that email about uh, CTXP. And uh, yeah, if you're if Virgin said like you're not familiar with um, CTXP, then uh, check it out on the YouTube. We we work pretty hard and spend a lot of money, a lot of the company's money, I should say, on um, <laughs> making those episodes. So uh, so by all means, give us another click or three. That'll that'll help the company coffers a little bit. Next uh, comment is from Cody via email. Um, Cody says I've been bringing. Oh, binging, excuse me. High side, low side since discovering it last month, and I've learned a lot about motorcycling. Um, I have you guys to thank for the inspiration of my first bike purchase, a 2008 KLR650 from Kawasaki. Uh, so far, Cody is loving it. Um, 
plenty of power <laughs> uh, to carry me as a proper big dude at 6'1 and 300 pounds at 65 or 70 miles an hour. Cody's question is, I like how thoroughly you guys review bikes, and there's one thing that usually goes by the wayside, and that's engine braking. I live in the Appalachian Mountains and have plenty of hills on my commute. My KLR rarely needs braking input to maintain speed downhill. I'm wondering how important engine braking is to you guys and what level you prefer on your machines. Um, this is an interesting question. Spurgeon, I think you, uh, you, should, you should take this one first. So I think it's important to note for our audience that might not be aware, when we talk about engine braking, we yes. are talking about the compression of an engine when you downshift, right? So when you, or, or just when you let off the throttle, let's say you're riding along and you let off the throttle, the compression that the engine is making from the pistons going up and down slows when it's not being fired. So, it, it, and I'm not Ari Henning, so I'm not gonna explain this as well as he <laughs> could, um, but it basically, it creates drag on the rear wheel and that naturally slows the bike down. So if you're riding in a, in a car, if you're not a motorcyclist, you can experience as well. Just take your foot off the gas and you can kind of feel the, the vehicle naturally slow down. Right. And there's a point to this where even if you're going downhill and you take your foot off the, the, the throttle or you, you kind of reel your hand back, the engine will naturally slow down the vehicle without even having to, um, you know, to, to put your, your foot on the brake. This is why if you're going down a very steep uh, downgrade, you'll often see a sign for like, you know, truckers to put your, your vehicle or your truck in a lower gear so that it creates more engine braking to assist with the, the braking. Mm -hmm. Um, it is Cody, so, probably something that we don't talk about very much here on high side, low side, <laughs> but I, I like engine braking. I like using engine braking. Um, and I like it in varying levels, depending on whether I'm on a racetrack or I'm off road or I'm on the street. It really kind of depends on the situation that I'm in, but I, I do use engine braking to my advantage at times. I'm not sure if you do, Zach. I do. A couple things to point out here. Um, if you are uh, an engine braking fanatic, Cody, um, you'll be happy to know that if you, if and when you upgrade to a sort of a fancier um, road-going bike, like a, I don't know, it's a, some sort of a high-end Ducati or something like that, sometimes um, those machines have adjustable engine braking because mm -hmm. the amount is of, of engine braking that a motorcycle gives you as you go downhill or you approach a stop, you roll out of the throttle, um, is ultimately adjustable based on how much air the engine is letting through um, the um, the throttle bodies and the intake side of the of the engine. The engine is essentially an air pump, right? It's like it's it's pumping air through, and there there are you know the ignition and explosions that are happening <laughs> create energy from the engine. But that's essentially what's happening is air is flowing through this pump. Um, and when you close the, the, the intake to the pump, then the pump slows and that's what's slowing your motorcycle down. So fancy motorcycles, some of them have adjustable engine braking, which you're going to get a real kick out of Cody when the time comes. Science, um, baby. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, in general, um, I think what was the, I'm just going to reference the question one more time. The How question important was, is engine braking to you right. and what and level, what do, you level do you prefer? Right. Um, I, I use it constantly. I like a, I like a, I would say medium to high level of engine braking um, because it's always easy to reduce engine braking. If you don't want it, you can always add a little bit of throttle or you can pull the clutch in as you approach a stop to, to uh, mitigate the engine braking and create less engine braking. But if your engine brake, if your bike does not have enough engine braking for your preference, there's really a good way to add it, if that makes sense. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I, I often, use engine braking to my advantage. And I think uh, the last thing that I would point out is that uh, Ari Henning did an episode of The Shop Manual, which is on the RevZilla YouTube channel, entitled, sorry, titled, um, Is Engine Braking Bad for Your Bike? And Ari goes into detail explaining what engine braking is and whether or not it will damage your motorcycle. <laughs> which is great um, content for those of you out there that are listening and, and, and really aren't grasping exactly. Uh, yes. Zach and I, are, I, I know that Zach and I are explaining this in a pretty damn scientific <laughs> way right now. Uh, but if you, if you want uh, maybe just a little bit more help, you should check out uh, Ari's yep. episode on that. Indeed. That's a, it's a, a kind of an interesting question and interesting that you're thinking about it, Cody. I appreciate that. Um, and I, I hope that you're, KLR continues to offer you plenty of engine braking for many years to come. <laughs> there you go. Comment number 16 uh, from Steve in upstate New York, who wrote us in an email, says, when I got into motorcycles and got into is in quotes uh, for those of you that uh, want to <laughs> know that. Hopefully that's not a euphemism, but anyway, yeah, continue. Yeah. When he got into motorcycles, uh, it seemed like the real uh, beginner, intermediate, advanced rider skill sets were associated with and presented as 
250 cc's, 600 cc's, 1,000 cc's, um, 1,000 cc bikes respectively, um, or at least on the street bike side. So specifically, probably maybe a little bit more on the sport bike side of, of things, um, if not the overall street bike side of things. Now, it seems like there are bikes all over the map. 300s, 400s, labeled as beginner bikes. A Yamaha uh-huh. Tenere at 700, which is a quote-unquote good mid-size bike. And now, a BMW making a GS1300 as a flagship product? Question mark, question mark, question mark. My question <laughs> is this. As engines continue to get bigger and the displacement needle moves farther to the right, where does this space race stop in order to keep rider skill levels realistic? At what point is an engine just too big? Hmm. This is a good question. It's a good question. Um, and it's something we've danced think, around before on the podcast, yeah, right? Yeah, like, it is. It is. And I'll tell a story that I've uh, told many times before, uh, or at least once before I know that, on the podcast, which is um, involves my dear old dad, who we heard from earlier today. Um, he came out and rode. Uh, he We had a, um, a Triumph uh, at the time street twin around as now now the speed twin 900 um sort of a like relatively entry level triumph bonneville it is a 900 cc parallel twin um and before he rode it his his outlook was very much like well i remember when the bonneville 650 was the baddest bike on the block and it was the fastest thing you can get and now the and the, like the the basement bonneville like the sl- slowest smallest one you can get is a 900 are you kidding me 900 cc's it's just too big it's too much this is crazy and then he rode it and then he was like, "Oh, it's actually pretty polite, and it's a great, it's this is this is a great little bike." <laughs> um, and I think that one of the things I need to touch on with regard to this question of when are engines just too big is the actual number does not necessarily correlate to how powerful, how difficult to use, how kind of figuratively big an engine is, right? It doesn't like Spurgeon, tell the whole for, story. Doesn't tell the whole story. For example, Spurgeon, if I said, um, I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to put my wife on a bike for, um, for this, this, this ride we're doing. I was thinking either a uh, Honda CR250 or a uh, Kawasaki KLR650. What would you say? KLR650. Right. Much bigger engine. However, much more polite motorcycle and much more reasonable for someone who is less skilled on a motorcycle. Um, For those of you listening, a uh, a KLR650 is a big, air-cooled, single-cylinder motorcycle. A CR. uh, Well, now is it like a cool now? I don't know. I did the review. I should know. Um, (laughs) Historically, big, air-cooled motorcycle. Um, I I could be wrong on that too. What the hell? But the point is, very low-powered, polite, uh, kind of a a lovable tractor. Whereas, like a CR250 is a two-stroke race bike that is a you know, a horse with a wild hair up its ass. It's, it's, it's just, yes. uh, it's going to launch you off. <laughs> right. So uh, on the topic of, are, are, can engines get too big? Um, you know, eventually they can. But I think that the, the fact that there was a, there was a, you know, an R1100 GS and then an R1150 GS and an R1200 GS and an R1250 GS and an R1300 GS, um, it is, um, it is, more to do with the evolution of 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 the the engines the more to do with the evolution not like creating more horsepower or creating more weight or making things more ridiculous it's really more about like now you know now a lot of what motorcycle manufacturers are doing is they're they're adding a little bit of displacement um, and they're changing the tuning of the bike a little bit to maintain horsepower maintain um, the amount of power that the engine gives but reduce emissions for um, for uh, you know European um, uh, emissions regulations or or DOT emissions regulations, whatever it is. Um, so it's it's there is a point where engines become too big, and you could argue that you definitely don't need a 1300 cc engine in your bike. You certainly don't. Uh, but part of it is what I just said about the you know them them having an evolution, and also part of it's market driven, right? As long as people will keep buying the next thing, then manufacturers are going to make it. And and I think it's important to note for anyone listening to this. It gets back to what we said a second ago. The, the the number doesn't tell the whole story. So, you know, a a 400 cc Ninja 400 is not the same as a Ninja 400. Uh, what's the race bike that? What's the Ninja 400 
brace by no, the, the ZX4 RR, the ZX4 RR, right? Like two right. completely different machines. Um, right. and, and so it is important that if you're looking at a GSXR 750 and a Honda Shadow 750, <laughs> you you know that there are two completely different performance scales that you're looking at there. The the, the Shadow 750 is a very mild mannered cruiser engine, and the 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 Gixxer 750 is a race bred inline four powerhouse. And 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 that's not easy to figure out. It takes time, and it takes educating yourself, and it takes a little bit of research. Um, and, and we've talked about this before on the podcast. Like we understand uh, Steve from upstate New York that some of this can get confusing and seem kind of, you know, just like we're going to the moon. Uh, but I think for anyone out there listening that is confused, perhaps like Steve, you know, think about uh, Zach's dad. Think about the the stories that we've told in the podcast in the past. <laughs> that number just doesn't tell the whole story. Yeah. Yeah, true enough. Um, it does. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's a fair question to ask, though, you know. Um, the good news is it's not like manufacturers are only presenting customers consumers us the motorcycling public with uh massive engine bikes you know like yeah you can get harleys with you know whatever 2000 cc engines and you can get this 13, 12 and 1300 cc adventure bikes and um yeah those are big engines but there's also lots of perfectly reasonable sized engines out there and it um, seems like they always come back around right like when you look at like yeah. K ktm at one point their biggest bore bike was like a 990 and then it was like an 1190 and then it was a 1290. And then they introduced a 1090 as well, but that wasn't quite small enough. So then they introduced a, a 790. Well, that might have been too small. So then they bumped that to an 890. And, and they, but like it always seems to come back around. Yamaha had a Tenere 1200, and then they introduced the 700. And then you know right. BMW had the R1250 GS, and they introduced the 850 GS. Like there's always there always seems to be a smaller option. Now to Steve's point, you know when we're looking at those middleweight bikes. They might have as much power as what some of us remember uh, from our youth, depending on how old we are, as yeah. like the biggest option that was out there. But you know, there there always seems to be something. I would argue right now, more so than ever before in motorcycling, there's there's a there's a seat for every ass, and and really you're going to have an easier <laughs> time finding a motorcycle that is specifically what you're looking for now than ever before. Did you just call Steve from up, upstate New York an ass? No, I said there's going to be a motorcycle we're all about that will fit and his, outreach here, Spurgeon. That's what I'm saying. Th it's, it's more inclusive than ever, Steve. <laughs> like you will be able to find a motorcycle that is right for you, no matter what. I promise you that. Right on, right on. Okay, well, I think we're 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 at that time, Spurge. We're at the final question um, that we're going to cover here today. Um, this is from Scott, the prodigal stranger, aka Chase's best friend. Agreed. <laughs> Prodigal Stranger yeah. uh, has been quite a uh, a friend of the podcast. Believe it. Indeed. That. Yeah. Uh, GFOP, um, a, a longtime listener and often writer inner, and um, and we we appreciate your viewership and listenership, uh, Scott. Scott says. Hello, high side, low side. I'm at it again. <laughs> uh, here before you is the complete list. So it's actually not before me. This is what this is just what Scott's email said. Here before you is a complete list of quote. That's a whole nother podcast um, sayings from the first six seasons of High Side Low Side. Why? Because I really like the work you find folks are doing, and I want many more episodes of your excellent excellent podcast. Scott does tend to kill us with flattery. Um, the point is, the I, point I, can, is, I can't actually Scott see this. Sat Scott down went through, yeah, Scott and, sat down and went through every single yeah. podcast and looked for every single time anyone said that's a whole nother podcast and created a list for us, uh, which is which is just a phenomenal. We we we'd like to. We're giving you a gold star for your work, Scott. So the first uh, the first time ever that this was used was. Um, and so Zach, Zach doesn't have the information. We're going to play a little quizzing game know. with Zach. I've got two pieces of paper here <laughs> from producer Chase, uh, and this is going to take us right into the engine sound guessing game. But in this case, I actually know the answers, and, and Zach does not. So, Zach, we're going to play a little quiz here with you. Um, the first time that Zach that this ever comes up as a phrase is Zach, who says it in Season 3, Episode 1. And Zach says, my tagline of this whole podcast is going to be, that could be a whole podcast by itself. So that's where this got started. <laughs> I yeah, and I'm, I'm true to my word. I, I that that has been my tagline, has it not? Well, that's what we're about to find out because we have two questions. The okay. question is, 
who's said it the most and mm. what was the total amount of times it was said so we're going to start we're going to start with Zach that's a whole other podcast how many times do you think that phrase was mentioned that's- since by, by, season by three, or episode just one, by, me? By, by, by total. How many times total. have have guests? Because the other thing is, this is caught on with our guests now. So we have guests on, <laughs> and guests know that this is a thing, and they start saying it. So total. How total. many times do you think that's a whole other podcast has been uttered since season three, episode one? Um, I'm gonna say, like it, like it feel, I gotta say, it feels like a lot. How many episodes have we done? Like a 30, lot, whatever. Twelve times Tw- six. <laughs> I'm not a math that's please, a but that's a lot. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say 27 times. You're not even close. <laughs> Way too low. 57 really? times. 57. Wow. That's, I mean, uh, and and for reference, I think I've said it twice in this episode alone. So <laughs> there, it's right. it's not even a one for that's one true. an episode thing. Sometimes it's multiple yeah, yeah. times in an episode. So okay, 57 that's true, that's true. times. 57 times. Wow. Okay. And so who has said it the most? I, w- I like to think it's me because I, the, I, I, I was the uh, evidently, uh, according to Scott, I was the 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 um, the prodigal stranger. I, w- I was the genesis of the phrase, right? You uh, were. This is something that I think of as as the highest low side audience thinks about this phrase. You get the credit for it, but does that mean that you said it the most? Hmm. I don't know. Who do you think? Spurge, Zach, or guest? <laughs> All the guests combined? All the, all the, just, all, yeah, all the guests combined. All the guests combined. Uh, I'm going to say all the guests combined. No. The answer is Spurge. Uh, <laughs> Sp- Spurge has said it 27 times. Wow. Zach has said it 25 times. <laughs> so, and, and Plus, I just said it twice in this episode, so now I'm up to 29. Uh, so I'm, I'm continuing my lead. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, all the guests combined was five times. Okay, so Five they're times. much more reasonable about this. <laughs> but you and I are you and I are toe for toe. This might be the first time in a race that I'm ever beating you. Uh, but like we mentioned earlier, uh, now that I've got a taste for the competition, uh, um, right? Now you're just uh, going to yeah. be saying it left, right, and center. Exactly. Okay. Well, I, ho- I hope that the list that the prodigal stranger um, provided to us also includes what the topics were, so that so that we can, uh, you know, have a list going. Because I, I haven't been paying attention. Well, if he, if, if Prodigal Stranger, if you haven't given us a list, uh, that's your task <laughs> for next season. Uh, you got to send us a complete list of everything that we haven't covered yet as a podcast <laughs> topic that we said we were going to. Oh, boy. Um, and uh, you, just a friendly reminder that you you cannot bill us for that time. We, we, can't, <laughs> afford, we can't afford that. <laughs> Uh, we'll send you a free T-shirt if we haven't already done so. Yeah, exactly. We'll Although, send you a T-shirt. I, I feel like with the amount of times you've written in uh, comments, Prodigal Stranger, you probably have a T-shirt in your collection at this point in time. <laughs> for those of you that have been following along for the last two hours, uh, we have spent two hours of your time talking about comments that you, our loving listeners, have written into us. We are going to wrap things up with the Rev Trivia guessing game. This has become a favorite of our of our high side, low side listeners over the last uh, season or two that we've been doing this. So right. we are going to, for those of you that are listening maybe for the first time, we are going to play an engine sound. Zach and I are not privy to what this engine sound is. We have three or we have two hints, one answer, um, and it's going to be up to us to try and guess what the engine sound is. And we don't have a guess to help us. It's just. No, Mr. Quartz and myself yeah, today. I know. I know. So. This, is us- this is usually even messier. But okay, let's let's do it. You ready, Spurge? I'm going to start the sound. On your mark, get set, <laughs> go. Smooth like butter. Yeah, some some very gentle revving there. Aside from the the starter, the starter sounded like it was sick. Listen (laughs) to that starter sound. It was. I think that might have been the fuel pump. 
Well, yeah, the, the starting sequence, rather. I'm sorry. Uh, I see, I see, yeah. Yeah, it <laughs> sounded like a, a modem from 1996 when you're trying to get on <laughs> AOL.com. Uh, yeah. Oof. Well, it's it's sort of low and grumbly. Uh, but I, I, how, I many, how, like, many, how many cylinders? I know, that's the tricky thing. I, I was thinking three, but I think it might be four. I think it's four. I think it's a big four. <sighs> my God, like my... My my initial reaction was three, but I don't think it is. Especially because I feel like we've just had a triple on for the for, right. with, with Doodle. I can't imagine our producer Chase would try and screw us over again like that time that he made us uh, pick an engine sound for a Triumph that hadn't been released yet. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it's it's a little bit low and grumbly. Let's should we do? Let's, let's listen one, more, one listen. more time. Yep. We'll listen one through, listen through one more time just to make sure. Well, she's a rever. I'll give her that. It's uh, I feel like people are getting cagey with their rev. You know, they're like revving real slow. Yeah, like yeah. It's hard to tell how heavy the flywheel is. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> but it does. Sound, but it does sound like it's not. It's not. I don't think. I don't getting think it's close true. to the red line. Yeah. No, no, I agree. But I do think it's a big four. What about a V four? Oh no, no. It's. A, I think it's big in line four. All right, my guy. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say. Uh, 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 a, a Kawasaki ZX14. I don't know. Okay. No, no, I, I was thinking like an FJR 1300. I was thinking. No, I think that's not a bad guess. Yeah. Yeah. But it, but it sounds, it that does sound kind of racy though. It sounds like the, it's kind of quick to rev, even though the revs were very gentle. Mm. Mm. So all do right. we have a hint? Let's do a hint. This is not going to help us at all, except for <laughs> it's going to confirm what we already knew. Uh, it is an inline four. So okay. Zach and I, we are at least on the right, right. track. Well, then I don't know. I don't have the. Well, let's what's just, the next hint? Let's let's jump right to hint number two. Yeah. Uh, this is a model that was first introduced in 2004. A model that was first introduced in 2004. That doesn't really help me very much. Kawasaki uh, Con Kawasaki Concourse was earlier than that, right? Yeah. I mean, the, well, the Concourse name goes back to the 80s. Right. But so when I don't was, think was, it would be that. When was so the they're all like R1 was. Was ninety nine, I think. Jixer one thousand was two thousand one. Hayabusa was ninety nine, I think. ZX fourteen might be two thousand four. That's what I was trying to no, think. No, but I think it was after that. I think the. Uh, gosh, I'm, I don't know. I don't know, and I don't. I'm not. I don't want to use Google. I don't want to cheat here. No, no. I think your guess of, uh, but the FJR goes back too far too. It, like well, a, well, it, well, what if it's an FGR? What if it's an FGR? What if it's like the first FGR thirteen hundred or the first Concourse oh. fourteen hundred? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe it could be. Or what if it's a Honda ST thirteen hundred? We didn't even think of. No, it's an inline four, that, so it wouldn't be that. Yeah, yeah so it wouldn't the, be the inline yeah. four. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't really have it. It could be a BMW K bike. Um, Ooh, I didn't even think about that. K twelve hundred. For those of you listening, a BMW K bike is a uh, is an inline four that that BMW mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. love BMW aficionados lovingly called the flying brick. Well, the, those are those are the those are the transverse or the longitudinal triples. The flying brick, technically, the K bike from the late eighties, early nineties. The K bike that I would be referencing would be a would be a um, transverse four. It would be it would be a similar design to a, any Japanese. But they weren't called four. flying bricks too. No, I mean maybe the nickname stuck. I don't think I've never called them that. I don't think that's true. Yeah, but you're an, you're an aficionado of another level. Your dad's <laughs> offering brake parts to our listeners via his attic. So <laughs> Kyle or whoever it was. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I don't have any other. I, that's that's all I can do. I can like keep naming inline fours that I think debuted in 2004, but I actually the truth is I don't know. Okay. Well, so we're, we we're we're thinking in big inline four either uh, Ninja Fort ZX 1400, Kawasaki right. Concourse 1400, something something along those lines. Uh, Yamaha. What, what do we got? I would have never. This is no. We're we're we're, we're very wrong. Uh, <laughs> this is a two thousand. This is a two thousand five Kawasaki Z seven fifty S. Okay. Do we get this bike in America? <laughs> uh, we got the yeah, Z eight. So. We got the Z eight hundred. 
Yeah, the Z750 and Z800, I think that maybe, I don't know if we got the 750, I'm not totally sure, but we got the Z800 and then the Z, you know, the Z1000, which is, a, was they were sort of like part of the same family there. Um, but I'm surprised that the engine's that small. I thought it was, I thought it was a, a bigger engine than that. I think the, the, the slow revving, you know, kind of confused me. It sounded very grumbly. I'm looking, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think this bike was available in America, was it? <laughs> I'm just very, and I wouldn't put it past Chase. That's to, true. To, he's he's yeah. conniving. He's sneaky. He would yeah. definitely do something like that. Yeah, I'm just I'm just I, the first bike that I remember in the Z line riding was the Z not not including the Z1000. Z1000 I think was the, probably the first in America that I remember. But the Z800 mm -hmm. right. was the first of the mid-sized. Right. Um, anyway, either way, the Z750 uh, engine sound was sent in by Josh. It does have an aftermarket exhaust on it. Uh, for those of you listening, uh, the Z line in Kawasaki's uh, lineup is a naked sport bike. It is mm -hmm. a inline four with uh, more of an upright position to it. If you remember back to well, uh, an episode that Lance and Zach and I did just one episode ago, we talked about how the uh, the whole naked sport bike craze was kicked off by people <laughs> wrecking sport bikes and rebuilding them into Street Fighters. And then uh, Ducati Monster was the first one mm. to uh, be an official release. And the, the Kawasaki Z line, you said they're inline force, but the, but technically you got Z125, you got Z400, uh, you got true. Z650, you got uh, I should I should have said they're the, na they're the naked sport bike line, is what I meant to say. So if I said yeah. that they're inline yeah. fours, I apologize. Yeah, whatever, it doesn't matter. Point. I just want to point out the, the, the diversity in the in the Kawasaki Z lineup is all. Um, but yeah, stumped us good there, whoever it was. What was the person's name again? That was Josh with Josh, his aftermarket exhaust. Uh, you got exhaust. us, Josh. You got us. You got us good. Uh, yeah, we need we needed a guest help, just like Spurgeon said. Um, but anyway, that was fun. I really enjoyed that game. I have a hoot every time, even when I am wrong. So I, th I think that's it, Spurge. Right? We, we're at the end of uh, episode. I'm still looking here. to see if this bike was ever imported to America. I, I'm <laughs> I'm stuck. I'm stuck in my own head now. So maybe our listeners can help us out. If the Z750S was ever imported to America, uh, <laughs> let us know. But yeah, so I think we've done it, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Uh, we have. <laughs> gotten to to and through the penultimate episode of of mm. high side low side for season seven which means we have one more episode in store for all of you listening I we're know. not going to give it away um remember to leave us a comment on youtube if that's where you listen shoot all comments uh and engine sounds to high side low side at revzilla.com please make sure to leave us a review on apple Podcasts. tell your friends about it if you got friends that ride motorcycles if you like what zach and i do please help spread the word wear your high side low side t-shirts proudly if you haven't <laughs> won one you can buy one over on RevZola.com. <laughs> and with that, Zach, any final thoughts? Final thoughts this time around. This time around. Uh, gosh, I don't know. What did I, what did I, what did I learn today? Um, well, you know, I had fun with the... I didn't know that anyone out there would think that a large displacement, high horsepower motorcycle was better to learn on on a racetrack i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't uh, i didn't see that coming but as you said we 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 appreciate um people who disagree and can uh, you know back up their opinions here on high side low side so i like that we covered that comment and i think that was an interesting conversation um and uh it was a it was a, it was a good little window outside our echo chamber here you know spurge uh the echo chamber <laughs> what about you what's your take <laughs> your big takeaway here from well this is the first uh, time this is the first 11. time we got to integrate your dad into the podcast uh, um, true true spurgeon, and you learned spurgeon about some senior. things that he has in his attic yeah spurgeon senior has uh, graced us with his voicemails uh on high side low side in the past this is the first time we got uh tim quartz on the episode and i think <laughs> the detail in which he uh showed us the familiarity of his uh bmw brake knowledge kind of sure. is a little bit of a window into uh into exactly what's lurking in your uh, future inheritance, basically. Just, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. piles of brake par pa parts in the attic. <laughs> indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah, all right. Well. Uh, and, and for those of you that want to maybe see a little bit more of Zach's dad and a little bit more of the relationship behind him, check out uh -huh. the CTXP episode uh, on the Sidecar Challenge because uh, I believe he has quite a, a section of is time it, in the intro yeah, of that a guest spot. episode. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah, especially in the intro. Yeah. All right. Well, um, from uh, from my daddy O to uh, to Spurgeon to me. Thanks everyone for listening to episode eleven. Um, we appreciate you hanging out, and we'll see you for the finale of episode seven next time around. Uh, season seven, I mean, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Bye bye. <laughs>